own uh, app on, so it uh, can stop uh, it from it can stop it happening. But I think when we are going to go live, it's going to to stop. Please place on the chat box and let us know if it uh, if it is stopped. Okay, uh, so we are going to start with some uh, announcements. Uh, so, so first of all, uh, please follow us on social media. So we have Twitter, we have uh, Instagram, and we have Facebook, and we are on LinkedIn as well. Please follow us, and then it's the uh, easiest way to get to you know what is going on and what's going to be our next meetings. If you want to talk to us, please send us an email on or talk to us on any of these social media. And uh, we have a feedback survey, that that's the link. We are going to place the link on the chat box uh, as well. A little bit of Zoom education. If you don't want to, to miss any information, especially on the right corner of your screen, please go to uh, view options on the top of your screen and then uh, click on side-by-side -side mode. Then you, you are able to see the speaker and uh, the entire uh, screen of the speaker as well. And if you want uh, to see only the speaker, you click on speaker view, or if you want to see all the panelists, you go to gallery view. Okay, uh, you can uh, talk to us uh, during the meeting and to other attendees. So it is important when you write something on the chat that you click on all attendees and panelists. In this way, your message is going to be seen by all the attendees and, and the panelists as well. And you have uh, any specific question, please place on the Q&A box. So during the presentation, we are going to be able uh, to uh, answer uh, as, as much as uh, we can. So now we are going to, to start our uh, neonatal and pediatric ECMO uh, meeting. I think Dr. Bartley already logged in. Let me take a look. Yes. Oh, not yet. Did he? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm in. Hi, Grace. Hi, Dr. Bartley. We are very, very happy to have you. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Very good. So shall we go try the screen share? Yes. See if I can make it work. This is harder than ECMO, Dr. Bartlett. This is <laughs> no, no. harder to learn about it. Let me try one more time here. Right, I'm. I can see this. Can you see it? No. Yep, you're good. All you got to do is yes. hit the slideshow, and we're good. Good. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right, can you all see this slide that says ECMO physiology? Yes. Good, wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. I'm sorry I'm a little, little late. We had some confusion about the time, but here we are. And so this will be quite a brief presentation. This particular session is devoted to neonatal and pediatric ECMO overall, not just cardiac support. And so I thought it would be worthwhile to go over some of this basic physiology and of course all of you on this call are used to doing this all the time but i've learned over the years that some of this very elementary physiology is forgotten over periods of time so we'll spend a few minutes talking about it so this summarizes all of oxygen kinetics physiology oxygen consumption which is everything that has to do with metabolism and nutrition and oxygen delivery, which has everything that has to do with heart and lung function. And with ECMO, we're dealing primarily with patients who are deficient in oxygen delivery, either because they have respiratory failure or cardiac failure or both. So we measure metabolism by measuring oxygen consumption. Can you see my cursor? Can you yes. see my? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, good. All right. So 
uh, we measure the metabolism, whether it's the basal metabolic rate or the resting energy expenditure as oxygen consumption, how much oxygen is consumed each minute, usually normalized to body weight or body surface area. Uh, and of course, the metabolism increases during sepsis, during work, doing standard exercise and so on. The oxygen that's used in that metabolism gets there from the arterial blood. And it's a function of the content of oxygen in arterial blood times the blood flow, which is the cardiac output, which is the oxygen delivery to tissue. At the same time, CO2 is produced and CO2 is excreted, but we deal with that. It's essentially the same amount of as oxygen, but the oxygenation delivery is much more important. Now, the actual numbers that uh, can be applied to this are shown here. Normal oxygen consumption for adults is 120 cc's per square meter per minute or three cc per kilogram per minute. For neonates, it's four cc per kilogram. Uh, and I'm sorry, for children, it's, it's four. And for neonates, it's five. So you can redo the arithmetic for neonates and children. These numbers apply to adults. So the normal oxygen consumption is three cc's per kilogram per minute or 120 cc's per square meter per minute. And the delivery is five times that. And that's always the case. So normal physiology is that there'll be five times as much oxygen delivered as is consumed in the process of metabolism. So that five to one ratio is very important. And there's many homeostatic mechanisms to try to maintain that ratio. So when we consider this physiology, we need to know the VO2 and the DO2. To do that, we need to know how much oxygen there is in blood at any given time. And then the DO2 adjusts by regulating cardiac output primarily to match the consumption to keep the ratio at five to one. But there's a huge safety reserve there. So it's only when the ratio gets to be less than two there's not enough oxygen to run the machinery, anaerobic metabolism, and lactic acidosis results. Now, all of you on this call know this, but the hardest thing to educate your colleagues in the ICU is this. This is the amount of oxygen in blood. The oxygen content is really the only important measurement. Here's arterial blood and venous blood. Uh, but we measure it as PO2 or saturation. And arterial blood is normally here. Venous blood is normally here. But of course, the amount of oxygen is totally dependent on the amount of hemoglobin in the blood. So the normal arterial oxygen content is 20 cc's per deciliter for neonates, for adults, and for everyone else. But notice that if the hematocrit is uh, only... 25 or so, there's half as much oxygen in the blood as there is normally. So normally the body tries to compensate for that increasing cardiac output to restore the ratio at five to one. A convenient way to measure all that is the saturation of blood in the venous return coming back to the heart. The arterial blood is normally 100% saturated. So if 20% of the oxygen is removed, the venous blood will be 80% saturated. Or if it's only two to one ratio, then the venous saturation will be 50%. And uh, under most circumstances, when it gets below that, then we're below the supply dependency uh, critical ratio and acidosis will result. Here's the same data presented in a different fashion. Again, this is for adults, but if oxygen consumption is three cc per kilogram per minute, the normal delivery is five times that, and that's the normal point. So if metabolism goes up or goes down, uh, cardiac output primarily changes in order to keep this ratio five to one. So this would be the isobar representing normal physiology. The venous saturation is 
75%, 60%, 50%. So uh, if the, met the metabolism starts here and then goes up because of activity or sepsis, delivery goes up. So if, if consumption doubles, in this example from 120 to 240, then the delivery doubles and the venous saturation is still 80%. So that relationship is, is very useful to manage any sick patient, particularly ECMO patient. So in summary, this is the normal range between delivery and consumption. This, in this range, physiology is perfectly normal, but we're getting close to not enough oxygen. And whenever that ratio falls below two to one, we're in a shock situation of lactic acidosis. So with ECMO, what we do is replace heart and lung function for all the obvious reasons. And we re we're replacing all these aspects of DO2 and VO2 on the, so that when we have a membrane lung, how much oxygen is supplied to the patient from the membrane lung. And we can calculate that in various ways. But if we look at the difference between the inlet and outlet content of oxygen in the blood, then we can determine at if the difference is a certain amount, we know how much oxygen is supplied. For example, if the ECMO flow is 40 deciliters per minute and the AVO2 difference is 5 cc per deciliter, then we're actually delivering 200 cc's of oxygen. And that's the number we need to know to determine how much we're giving to our patient and if the membrane lung is working properly. Now with uh, venovenous access, there's an interesting phenomenon that takes place because some of the venous blood in the right atrium goes to the circuit, becomes fully oxygenated, and we put it back into the right atrium, either through two catheters or a single double lumen catheter. And some of that venous blood that's in the right atrium goes on through the heart and lungs. Presumably the lungs are not working. So we're mixing venous blood with a saturation of 50, 60, 70%, something like that, with 100% saturation that we're returning to the patient. So how those two things are interrelated uh, can be determined from this diagram or from simple arithmetic. So here's the native venous saturation, let's say it's 60%. And here's the arterial saturation after we add some fraction coming from the membrane lung. Let's say we're adding half. So if the venous return is eight liters a minute, we're taking four liters a minute through the circuit. And we mix those two, and that gives us an arterial saturation of 80%. And you can look at any combination of the ratio between the circuit flow and the native venous flow and the various levels of saturation. The important thing is that with venovenous access, we'll essentially never be able to get to 100% saturation. It's normal, therefore, to have a saturation in the 80 to 90% range. That goes back to the phenomenon of how much oxygen is there in blood, what's the hemoglobin, and how we have to teach our colleagues that anemia is really bad for you. In fact, if you look at ECMO flow, again, this is adults, but you can apply the same to children and infants. At different levels of hemoglobin, this, and you, this is the amount of oxygen that you can supply. In this example, we're trying to supply 240 cc's a minute of oxygen, normal consumption for an 80 kilogram adult. So if the hemoglobin is 12, then the ECMO flow we need to do that is four liters a minute. If all of a sudden we're not delivering enough oxygen, the patient's getting more agitated, is coughing, getting a little septic. Now the metabolic rate goes up and we have to deliver more oxygen. How can we do that? Well, one way to do it is uh, simply to increase the flow and you could do that 
But another way to do it is to increase the hemoglobin so that under normal circumstances, if the hemoglobin is 15, which I remind you is normal, you only need two and a half liters a minute to support the patient. So I think this little diagram should be pasted on every ECMO circuit, uh, not to tell you what hemoglobin to use, but to tell you what the consequences are if the metabolic rate goes up, what's the easiest way to supply more oxygen, and always the easiest and safest way to improve oxygen delivery is to increase hemoglobin, not to increase flow. So a quick review, I hope you all knew that. I'm sorry if you were bored, uh, but you might find it useful to remind your colleagues that we're supposed to have a hemoglobin of 15. Now, I think we have time for questions and answers later on, correct? Grace. Hi. Yes. So we are going to have the question and answer a little bit later. We are going to have a break in the middle of the meeting as it's a long meeting of uh, uh, more than two and a half hours. So after the fourth, the first speakers that are going to talk mostly about VV ECMO, we are going to have time for questions and answers. And of course you can type your questions on the Q and A box on the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And then we can uh, answer during, during the meeting. If you're still listening to Dr. Bob um, Anderson on the, as a background voice, close your browser. We don't know why this is happening, but uh, some of the participants are listening to a second voice on the background. If you close your browser and only keep your Zoom app on, so you're going to get rid of this, uh, of this sound, okay? And if sometimes during the meeting, you, you can see the, the slides of the speaker, uh, it exits the full screen mode. Sometimes it ha helps. And if it doesn't help, you can log in again that you're going to, to see the, the slides again. Okay, you can uh, uh, type anything that you want on the chat box and uh, to talk to everybody. Don't forget to change for all panelists and attendees so everybody can see what, uh, you are, what you're talking about. Okay. So I think I'm the next one. I'm going to share my screen, just a second. You have to open the video, Grace. While that's, Sorry. While, that, while that's happening, I just want to remind all the panelists that we have questions popping up. If you have time to get into the, uh, the boxes and answer those questions, we can keep uh, the audience uh, up to date. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Perfect. Yep. Okay. So I'm very happy to be here today talking to you a little bit about respiratory ECMO. And I want to thank the Congenital Heart Academy for having me on all this organization. And we, we work really well as a team and I'm really, really happy to that. And I'm happy to have all the ECMO family here and uh, we know how important it is to have the support of uh, all the, the ECMO uh, family. I have no, no disclosures. So, well, after this very nice talk from Dr. Bartley, I, I will give you an overview about respiratory ECMO for the, in the pediatric ward. In the next 30 years, uh, more than 70,000 uh, ECMO runs were reported to the ELSA registry uh, regarding pediatric and, neon and neonatology. Uh, on, among them, 45,000 were respiratory, um, for respiratory support. So the survival to discharge rate is very good, is around uh, 70% for neonatal uh, respiratory ECMO and 60% uh, on the respiratory ECMO. Um, this has uh, been very steady over the years, but uh, uh, the complexity and the comorbidities of our pediatric and neonatological patients have uh, increased. So um, we are going to uh, publish the new uh, ELSO guideline 
for respiratory ECMO. And uh, we state there as an indication that uh, ECMO support should be offered in all patients with acute severe respiratory failure who demonstrate progressive persistent failure despite optimized conventional therapies and maneuvers. So acute severe respiratory failure uh, cannot be defined by, by a single value of PaO2 and or by a score or an index or a ratio. Indeed, life-threatening hypoxemia is a clinical judgment. So it accounts for the disease, the age, the comorbidities, and as Dr. Bartley uh, told us about, the tissue uh, oxygenating status of our patient. And of course, for example, this, this gentleman in the top of Everest will have a very low PaO2. And we all had very low PaO2 when we were uh, on our fetal life. So uh, we always have to consider the tissue oxygenation and the balance between uh, oxygen deliver and oxygen uh, consumption. This gorgeous single ventricle uh, kid has a very active life. Even, even then, his uh, rest uh, PaO2 is less than 50. So when we are on VV ECMO, we can have adequate uh, tissue oxygenation, even with low saturation, as Dr. Bartley uh, uh, told us uh, about. So the, the most important part uh, on ECMO support is uh, when we have severe hypoxemia that causes inadequate tissue oxygenation. This will be clinically reflected by low venosats, high lactate, metabolic acidosis, and signs of end, end organ uh, hyperperfusion. Of course, we want some numbers, and there are some well-accepted criteria for indication for VV ECMO, and that we can uh, use as a guidance uh, when we evaluate uh, each patient. So this is for uh, uh, adult patients. They are the entry criteria of the most uh, uh, important adult trials. For example, for the Aeolia, tri Aeolia trial, uh, they use these uh, references and to, to place the, the patients on the randomization. It's important uh, to, to remember that uh, severe hypercapnia uh, is an indication for the, uh, uh, respiratory ECMO as well. So here uh, is the neonatal uh, ELSO guideline that was uh, published a couple of months ago. And uh, you can see that now we talk much more about uh, a tissue oxygenation than a number as we use it to use like an oxygen index or the PaO2 or the PF ratio. So as we are talking about, uh, we, we could define what is severe respiratory failure, but uh, we need to define what is progressive persistent. We need to evaluate our patients in a, in a matter of uh, some hours, uh, not be too uh, quick, to make this evaluation in only one blood gas, but we can't uh, take this for uh, a long period of time. So usually uh, six uh, hours or uh, around that is enough for you to evaluate that your patient is in a progressive persistent failure. And optimize conventional therapy and maneuvers. It will depend on the, on the disease that we're talking about. For example, in the ARDS, optimized conventional therapy, we include high PEEP, neuromuscular blockers, and prone position. So this paper uh, that was published in 2017 uh, uh, makes uh, us to see the data of 22,000 uh, ECMO patients who were both cardiac and respiratory. And when we uh, have the, the respiratory uh, cohort, we see that the most frequent uh, indications for VV ECMO was acute respiratory failure, followed by bronchiolitis viral and bacterial pneumonia. The results were very good. The best results were for asthma on PEDS and uh, meconium aspiration on the neonate population, and the worst results are for pertussis. So the contraindications. We know that uh, we, should, we should give all the patients that would have a good prognosis and amongst uh, about survival and about disability after the ECMO run, the possibility to, to have the ECMO. So we kept this on the guideline as an open statement to make you think about as an individual patient who would benefit uh, from, from that. Um, time on mechanical ventilation prior to ECMO, is this a contraindication? 
Well, in the adult world, they say that if you're, the patient is ventilated more than seven days, his uh, chances to benefit from ECMO will decrease. On the pediatric population, we had this paper showing that the patients who were ventilated uh, for more than 14 days had a lower uh, likelihood of survival. But uh, nowadays, especially with the advent of the lung protective ventilation, we should decide on a patient basis, patient to patient basis, if, a pa if the patient is having more than 14 days of mechanical ventilation, if we are going to uh, provide him uh, to, uh, the opportunity of ECMO or not. So this is quite a, a busy slide, but the message is that uh, the ECMO will benefit the patients with respiratory failure in a variety of mechanisms. The ECMO support will improve the tessidual oxygenation and the CO2 retention, improving the respiratory and the metabolic acidosis. And as we decrease the vent settings, we are going to decrease the mechanical power and we will prevent VILI. And later today, we are going to talk about how to ventilate on ECMO and this wall will be going to be addressed uh, a little bit better. But all these factors, they are going to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance and increase the venous return, improving the cardiac output and the organ perfusion. I'm sorry guys, my internet connection is very bad today. I'm trying to get it better. Okay, so of course, when we indicate ECMO, we need uh, to think, to keep in mind that uh, we have short-term and long-term complications. Today, uh, later today, Gonzalo and Kion are going to talk about uh, these complications that influence quality of life of our patients, but we, we need to keep that in mind. Well, the most common uh, mode of ECMO support for respiratory failure is VV ECMO. And uh, the cannulation for VV ECMO varies according to local expertise, equipment availability, and the patient properties. Here we have a double lumen uh, a cannula that can be used in a single vessel. And here we have a, a dual site drainage. So we have the femoral vein and we have the jugular vein. In this picture, we are using the cephaled uh, cannulation as an additional uh, venous uh, drainage to increase uh, the, the ECMO flow. So here in the dual site uh, cannulation, as you can see in the x-ray and, and the, the diagram, we usually use the femoral for drainage and the jugular for return. In small kids, this may be uh, difficult because the fem veins are very small. So the double lumen uh, uh, cannula would, uh, would be better. Uh, and the double lumen cannula can uh, make the cannulation faster because we're going to use only one vessel and it can make mobilization of the patient uh, a little bit better. So in this publication, Gaius shows us uh, his experience with the double lumen cannula, the Avalon cannula, in uh, 72 neonates, most of them with meconium aspiration syndrome. Uh, they used uh, surgical uh, cannulation, uh, semi-Selginger cannulation, and ha they had a very good uh, survival rate, um, almost uh, 90%. But what uh, uh, is uh, what they experienced was a uh, high incidence of cannula perforation, as other case reports uh, have shown too. So this is a current concern. We are not very sure about the mechanism of this. This is not uh, very frequent, but we need to keep that on mind. So it's important to know that uh, percutaneous cannulation is feasible in the pediatric population and many centers are adopting it. This paper shows also data regarding the type of cannulation. Overall, one fourth of the cannulation um, were percutaneous and the trend is to increase. As you can see here in the beginning, uh, in the uh, early years, in 2007, less than 20% of the cannulations were percutaneous. And in the last data in 2015, almost 30% uh, were, were percutaneous. You can notice that uh, the percutaneous cannulation was used more in the patients who are bigger and older. As an advantage, uh, percutaneous cannulation showed less complications uh, and the type of cannulation didn't uh, change the mortality. This is a report from uh, Texas children and they were not uh, uh, talking about the, the kind of cannulation, but you can see 
that 45%, almost half of the patients had uh, percutaneous cannulation and they didn't face any complications. And here, uh, Andrea, our colleague from uh, Italy, showed that even on small babies, we can uh, perform a percutaneous cannulation uh, with no, no complications. And uh, to finalize, I want to say that single ventricle patients can be supported by VV ECMO uh, when they have respiratory failure. So the potential benefits of VV ECMO uh, on this population are to keep the pulsatile systemic blood flow which will avoid systemic vasoconstriction and improve end organ perfusion, and uh, to reduce the pulmonar vascular resistance, which is crucial for the single ventricle physiology. In certain cases, in certain anatomies, uh, we can uh, prevent these uh, patients to have systemic uh, embolic events like stroke. This will happen if you have your uh, return cannula in the superior vena cava in a gland patient, or if you're supporting a fenestrated Fontan patient. Here uh, in this paper, uh, analyzing the ELSO registry uh, data, you see 89 patients with single ventricle who were supported uh, on VV ECMO. 70% of them had a double lumen cannula. And uh, you see the survival to discharge were almost 50%, which is pretty good for single ventricle uh, cannulation. So the take home messages uh, are VV ECMO is effective can uh, provide support while you rest the lungs to give time to heal or to bridge the transplant. Matteo is going to talk about uh, that in a while. And uh, percutaneous cannulation is feasible in uh, pediatric patients and single ventricle patients can be supported uh, by VV ECMO. That was it guys, thank you very, very much. Sorry for my internet connection. Thank you very much, Grace. What's a fantastic presentation. But it's now to go to the next speaker that is uh, first is a uh, big friends, and then is a uh, real big consultant pediatric intensivist from uh, the Bambino Gesù Hospital in Roma. In the, uh, he's also member of the steering committee of the HELSO. It's a big pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Matteo Di Nardo. Thanks a lot and uh, now it's your time. Hello, everybody, and thanks for the kind invitation to this brilliant meeting. Uh, for the, the next uh, 15 minutes, we are going to speak about uh, the role of ECMO as a bridge to lung transplant, uh, both in adults and in children. Uh, I have no disclosure at all, uh, but uh, I would like to thank uh, the parents of some of my patients that uh, support me with some uh, video clip that I use for uh, this presentation. So um, the lung transplantation uh, is a, an old procedure uh, as we speak about adult lung transplantation. It is dated uh, in uh, 1973 with the first uh, adult lung transplantation. And nowadays, uh, what we can see is we have uh, a huge number of adult lung transplantation, at least more than 4,000 every year for adult but very few, more than 100 uh, cases every year for pediatric. Uh, adult lung transplantation as well, uh, pediatric lung transplantation is uh, uh, a procedure that uh, must be performed in high specialized center because it's the therapy for uh, the chronic respiratory failure. That is a completely different uh, uh, respiratory failure when compared with the adult one. For this reason, especially in children, uh, lung transplantation become a surgical challenge and the uh, outcome are very, very, really, very much related to the center expertise. Consider that in pediatric, uh, the centers that are considered expert perform at least five procedures every year. And uh, as you can imagine, the learning curve is not so high. Uh, when we speak also in children, uh, it is also to evaluate the important role that we have for the immunosuppression in a, a developing pediatric immune system. This is, is less important for adults, but consider that the uh, lung transplant in general is the transplantation which requires the, the most number of uh, drugs for immunosuppression. Infection in adults and in children is the leading cause of death. And in children, one of the things that we must 
taken uh, in consideration for uh, to improve the outcome is the psychological aspect, especially when we reach to lung transplant. If we consider the use of uh, um, lung transplant in children, we must recognize that is uh, much related to uh, the age of the children undergoing to lung transplant. And uh, also there is a different uh, among country uh, regarding the disease uh, that uh, requires lung transplantation. As you can see here in Europe, cystic fibrosis is uh, the leading cause of um, lung transplantation, while in North America, it's at least 50% with the other uh, disease. Which are the main problems, uh, not only for pediatric, but in general, there is uh, all over the world uh, an important short, shortage of donor. This is more acute for pediatric donor. And uh, the world is actually addressing this problem using alternative donor. And we will speak a little about that. There is a, a huge mortality, a very high mortality on the waiting list. For sure, lung allocation score, uh, the use of lung allocation score for lung transplant increased the availability of organ, but the lung allocation score work mainly for patients over uh, 12 years old. And special policy all over the world are used for, for children. Another important bias is that the listing criteria for the referral to a waiting list are the same for adult than children. And children, as you, can, as you know, are not the same as adults. So uh, as I was saying before, a few cases, like expertise and pure result. What is the actual, uh, uh, the alternative donors uh, that are going to, to be used and are used for adults are the extended criteria donor lungs. And for extended criteria donor lungs, we uh, intend uh, lung, donor lungs with a PF ratio below 300, uh, expected donor ischemic time over six hours, the use of uh, DCD donors and all donors with 55 years, more than 55 years old of age. Uh, as you can see here, also in children, the use of uh, extended criteria donor doesn't impact, of, uh, do not impact of, uh, on outcomes. And for outcome, in, in, we mean uh, survival and also um, the freedom from chronic uh, lung associated disease, uh, that is the CLAD. Uh, in adult, there is an important use of uh, normothermic VO lung perfusion to uh, test and also regenerate when possible uh, marginal donors' lungs. And uh, we don't have to forget, especially in children, that uh, uh, when there is not the, the, the availability of a suitable uh, donor, it is possible to use in experience hand the use of uh, downsizing uh, lobar transplantation from adult cadaveric donor lungs. But coming back to the main topics of our talk, uh, we need to ask uh, why we need to bridge someone for a lung transplant. Generally, the main reason is to prolong the pre-transplant pre life expectancy. Because they, uh, as I was saying before, uh, there is a very high mortality on the waiting list. Second, the importance of the bridge lung transplant is to preserve the likelihood of a good transplant, uh, post-transplant clinical stability. And to do this, uh, we have to work uh, with an equip. There is a multidisciplinary approach when we deal with this patient because we have to evaluate uh, when we decide uh, the selection of this patient, uh, several aspects. The first one is uh, a good functional status, in, in particular, the physical reserve. We, when we bridge someone, we must be really sure that there are no chances of improvement of that kind of uh, uh, respiratory failure with maximal conventional therapy. Our patient should not be on uh, refractory systemic infection and all the other organs, despite of the lung, uh, should be quite good. So we refer to this with liver, with uh, kidney and so on. Also, the family background and psychological aspects are very, very important for the adherence to the immunosuppressive protocol and also to the acceptance of the bridge to lung transplant. Uh, one of the biggest, biggest experience uh, with the use of bridge to lung transplant comes from Toronto, from the group of Toronto. 
And as you can see here, from 2006 to uh, 2016, the number of patients transplanted improved a lot. Uh, and as you can see here, in this study, uh, we have uh, 1,000 and uh, more than 100 cases of lung transplant performed. And among these, uh, only 72 adult patients were bridged to lung transplant. This is an important message because also in experience centers, the bridge to lung transplant is a procedure that uh, uh, is performed not all for, for, not for, for not all the patient. And uh, as you can see on this other part of the slides, uh, there, are, there is a, a wide variety of techniques used to bridge a patient, to, for bridge uh, someone with, uh, a lung, for a lung transplant. Uh, in general, if we have to choose the best option uh, for bridging, uh, uh, my personal step is to go back to the physiology and to evaluate uh, if our patient is on hypercapnic respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure, or a mixed uh, respiratory failure plus an hemodynamic compromise. In all these three situations, the option varies. Uh, the first step, uh, the hypercapnic respiratory failure, is generally managed with BV ECMO, but actually several CO2 removal machines have been introduced on the market and can, uh, can be used also for this purpose. We don't need like flow to remove uh, uh, CO2 and generally the most common approach is the use the, with the use with the lab, double lumen cannula. When instead we have uh, an epoxemic respiratory failure, of course, uh, in a great part of the cases, the VV ECMO is the, um, most important procedure and most common procedure. Uh, the configuration can be with uh, one double lumen cannula or with two cannulas, but sometimes when there is a, a, a pulmonary hypertension that uh, can create some problem, also the ECMO can be used. In case of hypoxemic failure and hemodynamic compromise, for sure VA ECMO is the most common approach. Uh, the peripheral cannulation uh, is not uh, used uh, commonly, uh, except in an uh, emergent situation. Generally, the most uh, frequent configuration is the VA ECMO using uh, the sport configuration, so or the axillary vessel or the carotid vessels. Uh, this is a, a, an option, uh, especially when we want to uh, uh, favor the ambulation and uh, uh, start mobilization in our patient. Uh, in our hospital, in Children's Hospital Bambino Gesù, uh, for children, uh, when we expect uh, a long run and we know that uh, the organ allocation will be uh, quite difficult, uh, we use this kind of approach. Uh, the, uh, the central cannulation uh, with the pump. In children, uh, uh, there are several experiences also using uh, the same approach as I told you before, connecting the pulmonary artery to the left atrium uh, without the pump. So using the um, pumpless device, like for example, the Novalang, the Novalang as you can see in uh, this, uh, this picture. And there are actually important recommendations for this kind of um, of procedure that is quite, ma quite, more quite, quite much more applied in adults than in children. Instead, uh, if we want to give you, if, uh, uh, if I want to give you a, a much wider vision, uh, for sure, uh, um, when we think about uh, bridge trunk transplant, we have to also to consider two important points, the patient mobility and the simplicity, simplicity of the configuration. Uh, according to uh, several experiences, my personal experience, VV ECMO is a very, is a very suitable option uh, for both patient mobility and simplicity. Uh, of course, according to the type of cannulation, neck cannulation or uh, with two cannulas cannulation, so uh, jugular and femoral, it will be uh, a little bit difficult the ambulation, but it's always a suitable option for uh, this kind of patient. Instead, what we do not like to do is the VV ECMO with an atrial septum defect and the VA V ECMO to, um, to overcome problem of uh, mixed cardiac and respiratory failure. 
something about the patient management. The patient management is not too much different from uh, the general ECMO management. Uh, as you can imagine, these patients are basically hypercarbonic and we do not want to decrease uh, very fast the uh, PaCO2 in the blood. We want to maintain an equilibrium. These patients are generally uh, uh, with uh, um, respiratory infection, so the number of the level of fibrinogen or platelets in the blood uh, is quite high. So we generally provide to this patient a higher level of um, heparin, or it is possible also to use alternative uh, drugs for anticoagulation, like, for example, the ergatroban of the bilivarudin. The pump flow uh, is not an issue, but it's generally uh, between 60 ml per kilo, according to the patient need, as Dr. Butter was, uh, was saying before. Uh, how to manage the lung uh, during a bridge to lung, the native lung during a bridge to lung transplant? Uh, there is uh, for sure uh, a great interest to maintain uh, the spontaneous bleeding and the, the spontaneous breathing and to avoid uh, uh, mechanical ventilation during ECMO. Uh, mechanical ventilation during ECMO has been associated to poor outcomes, but uh, if we still consider the experience of Toronto, as well as the experience of the center of Vienna, that is of, um, I provided the same result, uh, maintaining an awake ECMO is not easy. And in their experience, uh, 35 of the 72, uh, 71 patients reached to transplant were awake. So less than half. Uh, this means that not all the patients can be managed awake. But this uh, must not be considered effectively a real contraindication. If we cannot provide an awake ECMO, we have to do all our best to uh, maintain uh, a good physical uh, performance and status of our patient also in invasive mechanical ventilation. And this is an example because um, uh, several centers that are not able to perform for many reasons an awake ECMO in their patient uh, generally perform an early tracheostomy. An early tracheostomy, especially in cystic fibrosis patient, uh, allows to perform uh, uh, the cleaning of uh, the secretion with the bronchoscopy and uh, also uh, allow to reduce sedation and uh, to perform early mobilization. Uh, when Taking in consideration the bridge to transplant in pediatric patient, we have to consider that these are children, they require spe special needs, and uh, we don't have to forget that uh, these patients require the constant support of the family, the constant support of a good nutrition, and also to play when it's possible. So uh, one of the approach that uh, are generally use are uh, the uh, liberation from the bundle, and uh, this bundle are considered uh, uh, to maintain uh, the spontaneous breathing when it's possible during the day and to keep the patient sleeping during the night with the support of drugs, for example, melatonin, uh, to grant any time the comfort and analgesia, to prevent the delirium, to favor the early mobilization, to use and empower the family, and to uh, take into account uh, good nutrition. Because this patient, uh, if they arrive to a lung transplant uh, with a good body mass index, uh, have more chance to uh, overcome some of the complications that we can see. Uh, these are just some of the experience that, that we, can, uh, we have in our center with adolescent patient. Uh, as you can see here, these patients are intubated and sedated. It is possible uh, in this patient to do some mobilization, to, uh, to speak with them using uh, writing and uh, try to speak with them uh, following the, their need. Another uh, option that we can do in this patient is the mobilization of uh, the leg. Uh, it is possible to mobilize patient also with the bed cycling and also with the femoral uh, cannulation. Uh, of course, uh, it is a balance of uh, sedation and uh, trying to maintain uh, uh, the patient uh, awake, uh, avoiding the discomfort of the tube. We don't have to forget that uh, it is possible also during ECMO and during tracheostomy to uh, 
to let them eat and to, to let them drink uh, several things. And uh, this is important for the psychological uh, aspect. Uh, having the parents and uh, allow them to speak and to eat with them uh, can really improve a lot the psychological uh, support. S some words about the, the outcome. Uh, these are adult outcomes, uh, and these are uh, the outcome from uh, the center of Toronto. Uh, as you can see here, patients that have been bridged compared with that with patients that uh, were not bridged at least have the same outcome, and the survival rates uh, at one year are around 70% of all the patients bridged, reaching the 51%. That is the benchmark also for several patients not bridge at five years. I really thank you very much, uh, all the people that support me to prepare uh, this talk, and especially the nurses of my intensive care and the parents of my patient that provide me this uh, extraordinary video clip. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Matteo. It's very nice to see how you're able to do the awake ECMO and try to keep your patients waiting for lung transplant in a very uh, good mood and uh, in a good uh, in a good shape as well this is this is very important uh, uh, very very good job that you are doing and now we are going to have uh, Humbo Jerome I have no idea if your French name is is right you can correct me please and he is a French pediatric intensivist working since 2012 in uh, in Paris where he is the head of ECMO program and the mobile ECMO team. He's actually leading a, an European study on the behalf of Aero Elso on the mechanical ventilation settings during ECMO for pediatric ARDS. So he's going to, with a lot of property, talk to us about how to ventilate the patients on ECMO. Thank you, um, Hambo. You can share your screen, please. Okay. Okay. Um, can you hear me? It, okay. Yes, your, your yeah. uh, video is off. If your okay. internet connection can allow, you can turn it on. If not, it's okay. Okay, we just put the video. Just, just one minute. Okay. No, it's good. <laughs> okay. okay. So first, um, I would like to thank Grace for the invitation. Uh, as you can hear, I'm French. English is not my first uh, language, so I will try to speak as clearly as possible. Um, up. Why? Okay. Okay. We had uh, one Brazilian, one Italian, and now one French. English uh, were not uh, our first language at all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have no disclosure for this talk. And what I'm going to talk about, um, I will mainly speak about mechanical ventilation during ECMO. The main topic was uh, mechanical ventilation during VA ECMO, but as you will see, there is not a lot of data. So I will also speak uh, about mechanical ventilation during VV ECMO. And in the second part of the talk, I will just uh, speak a little about the side effects of inappropriate ventilation and we'll propose to you some the available recommendation. And what I will not talk about, uh, I will not uh, talk about indication, uh, left ventricular management and cardiovascular management, management during VA ECMO, and not speaking a lot about winning of VA ECMO. So why is it interesting and important to talk about mechanical ventilation during VA ECMO? A ventilation is one of the central treatment for um, crit critically ill uh, patients. And as you probably know, there is two ways to be uh, not a good ventilator. Uh, excessive mechanical ventilation can lead to volotrauma, barotrauma, and atelic trauma. And as you can see on the right of the, uh, do you see my pointer? On the right of the slide, it's an old uh, study from Jeffis and O and et, et al. And the inner mice model, they just use a non-protective mechanical ventilation from 
during 20 minutes. And as you can see on the right of the slide, the lung is uh, really congestive with a lot of mechanical ventilation uh, induced uh, lesions. Um, in contrary, uh, when you use an insufficient mechanical ventilation, it could lead you to a ventilator perfusion mismatch and uh, alveolar collapse. Alveolar collapse. Uh, in both cases, uh, if you do not use the right settings for your mechanical ventilation, you will probably delay the winning of your VA ECMO. But you may you may uh, are going to ask, but why speaking about mechanical ventilation during VA ECMO? Because most of these patients are, are assist for cardiac failure, not for lung failure. Um, however, in uh, 211, um, Perbet et al. Um, published an interesting uh, review on cardiac arrest and lung function. And they identified that six, 65% of people have, uh, are suffering from aspiration pneumonia after cardiac arrest. And, Moreover, 6% of them will present it in IRDS. <clears throat> and more recently, uh, Alfares et al. Um, published that even, the, even if the lung function of your patient is normal at the beginning of the ECMO, it could be impaired during the ECMO with several uh, mechanisms, like the transfusion-related acute lung injury, systemic inflammation related to ECMO circuit, ischemia, reperfusion syndrome, and ventilator-associated pneumonia. So mechanical ventilation is a central treatment in ECMO, which it could be VA or VV ECMO. But VA ECMO and pulmonary function um, has a complex interaction. And recently, Bashman et al. Uh, published um, in a porcine model that when you are winning from a VA ECMO, there is a substantial reduction, uh, substantial increasing, sorry, of the pulmonary blood flow, um, which is due to the ECMO VA venous drainage. So when you are decreasing VA ECMO blood flow, you will increase the pulmonary blood flow and you will have an impact on the mechanical uh, and on the lung function of your patients. So, I was uh, really interesting in this topic. So I look for interesting publication in mechanical ventilation and VA ECMO. And I was quite disappointing because in VA ECMO, there is nearly nothing published. In VV ECMO in adults, I will speak about some observational descriptive study, but in both cases, VVA and VA ECMO, there is actually no study comparing several ways of invasive ventilation settings. I choose to, to speak about two studies. It's mechanical ventilation during VV ECMO. The first one is the live guard study. It's an international observational study in 23, 23 centers worldwide. It's only VV ECMO. And they just describe what, I, what is going to be uh, performed in several centers. They conclude that there is a large use of ultra protective ventilation, which is defined by a driving pressure lower, lower than 15. But unfortunately, they do not succeed in um, highlighting an association between mechanical ventilation settings during the first two days of ECMO and survival rate. They only uh, find an association between the increasing of the tidal volume and the lower delta pressure during the ECMO course with the six months mortality. The other interesting study is a French study. Sorry for that. It's a monocentric study on VV ECMO uh, only. And they look for the inflammatory markers like interleukin-6, SRH, CCL2, and MCP1 and look for association between this, the level of this marker and the type of protective ventilation during ECMO. The, the methodology was quite complex, but to be simple, they use um, IPEP, which was set at 15 millimeter of micro, um, uh, very high PEP, it was 20, and low PEP, it was five uh, millimeter of micro. And they look for, uh, and maybe, 
who is my pointer? You can look in the bottom of the slide. So there is four type of protective ventilation with high PEP and low delta pressure, very high PEP and very low delta pressure, which was defined by uh, four uh, points. Low PEP and high delta pressure, low PEP and low delta pressure. They only uh, identify a strong reduction of all biomarkers when you start the protective ventilation during ECMO, but there is no difference between all the, all the settings. So the conclusion of their publication was the best setting for mechanical ventilation was still under investigation. So I looked for via ECMO and mechanical ventilation and was wondering what are the objective of this ventilation. There is three main objectives. You have to, to perform a coronary artery oxygenation to minimize lung injury alveolar and to optimize the lung function. If you fail to achieve one of these objectives, it might lead to delay your ECMO winning. So looking at PubMed for VA ECMO and mechanical ventilation in children, nothing is published. So I look up for VV ECMO and mechanical ventilation in children. And there is two recent uh, publication, uh, it's only observational and retrospective uh, studies. And the first one is by Friedman et al. in just uh, the last month. They look in five European centers and just describe what were, what were the difference between center uh, considering ventilatory settings um, <laughs> during VV ECMO. And um, they conclude that each center use its own settings, but it not seems to have any uh, in interaction with the survival rate. And they only find an association between the FiO2 concentration at day three of ECMO and survival rate. The level of PEP, the level of the PEP and the driving pressure was not associated uh, with the, the modification of the survival rate. Stop. Why it stop? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Fresh. Okay. And the second publication um, was published in two and two thousand and seventeen. It's a retrospective European survey in five countries, forty eight patients, only VV ECMO for bacterial pneumonia, and they highlight uh, they also highlight a wide spectrum of management during ventilation mechanical ventilation during VV ECMO. And as you can see, some centers uh, are using a PEP uh, higher than 15, as other centers a PEP lower than 10. But the conclusion was the same. There is no relation uh, between mechanical ventilation setting and survival rate uh, nowadays. But if there is no relation between the mechanical ventilation and survival rate, what, what are the side effects of an, an inappropriate settings? In VA ECMO, there is two main side effects. The first one is uh, impairment of myocardial recovery, which will delay the VA ECMO winning. Because if you have a low oxygen concentration in the ECMO circuit associated with a persistent lung injury, you will have an hypoxemia in the coronary arteries. Moreover, if you use a too high PEP, you will limit the venous return uh, to your patients. The second uh, severe side effect is called the Harlequin syndrome. It's an hypoxemia in the upper part of the body. Uh, it's also um, happening when you have a recovery of your left ventricular function, but a persistent lung injury. It, this uh, uh, side effects uh, mainly happen when you have a VA ECMO and a lung injury, and you are using a peripheral femoral reinjection during your VA ECMO. You will have a collision of retrograde ECMO blood flow with the integral cardiac ejection, and we, you will have a mixing zone. And depending on the blood flow, uh, your cardiac blood flow, the mixing zone will move throughout the aorta. The only treatment for the complication is to optimize your mechanical ventilation or to switch to VAV ECMO or to VV ECMO. So in conclusion, is there any recommendation 
uh, on the mechanical settings doing ECMO. Um, to be honest, I only found, found a health SOAR recommendation, which just explains some limits that you have to limit the peak inspiratory pressure to 20 to, to use a high and expiratory pressure of 10. You have to control your tidal volume between six and eight millimeter per kilograms and use a low respiratory rate. They also insist, and in my opinion, it's the more important part that you have to use everything you can to improve the pulmonary function, like bronchoscopy, prone positioning, prone positioning. You, as you say, you see just before, you can use prone positioning during ECMO, VV and VA ECMO. And they conclude the recommendation by the key message that no single ventilation strategy is actually universally practiced, practiced. So in conclusion, we know what not to do, you, but we are still looking for what to do uh, good for the lung. So it's, it's still a broad research area. And as a great speak uh, at the beginning of my talk, the Mevirac study is in process, progress, and we hope to have like interesting results. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambo. It was very nice. And uh, we are sure that uh, the research that you're conducting, we hopefully you're going to answer some of these questions that we already don't have the answer. OK, now we are going for a, a short break. We're going to have the discussion with uh, all the panelists. And uh, I'm just uh, have something to to talk to you before that, just reminding you about our Congress. So. Shall I talk, Grace? Would that be OK? Yes, of course. Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think there's some people here from Vietnam, which I think is 2 o'clock in the morning. So thank you all for being here. My name is Gil Warnofsky. I'm one of the co-founders of the Congenital Heart Academy and also co-chair for the Eighth World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery, which happens uh, once every four years. Obviously, this is challenging in the COVID era, and we're learning about distance learning through the academy. Uh, and it's just wonderful to see uh, over 800 people for most of this uh, session, especially for topics such as this. Um, I just want to say we're currently planning on having both a live and hybrid meeting uh, in September of 2021. And for the first time ever in the World Congress, uh, there are dedicated tracks for perfusionists, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, ECMO, and mechanical circulatory support specialists, uh, as well as the uh, what many of us on this, uh, on this call are involved in, which is cardiac intensive care, cardiovascular nursing and cardiovascular disease in the neonate. It is an interdisciplinary meeting, um, depending on how many people we can put in the convention center based on the pandemic, will determine a lot of what our next steps are. Stay tuned through the Academy and you'll have more information. And thanks again so much for everyone who's uh, tuned in from I think what over hundred countries today, Grace, something like that. Truly fascinating what this new platform could do. I guess I should also add that um, you know, the pandemic has been terrible and my heart goes out to so many families. Uh, there are silver linings. One of them has been Zoom. I didn't know Zoom has been around since 2011. <laughs> Who knew? But I think we've all gotten comfortable now uh, with this as a communication connection and education tool. And if you have ideas for uh, future sessions, please put them in the SurveyMonkey link that uh, Grace has uh, put us here. Thanks again. And Dr. Bartlett, just my personal thanks for being with us and helping kick this off and starting this whole field. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you and your vision. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gil. And uh, it's been a huge pleasure. And I need to acknowledge uh, the people, the panelists that are here. They're not the speakers today, but they are doing a very, very good job on the a Q and A at Daniel Garros and Jack Priltzer and Javier and Sri, and we are really, really happy to, to have all of you with us. So everybody should uh, um, get this opportunity to ask your questions to such amazing people. So uh, we are going to have the discussion now, and then we are going to continue on the second part of our uh, meeting. But uh, please use the question and answer, and uh, it's going to be very good. You're going to uh, learn a lot from 
this amazing uh, faculty. Okay, uh, Sasha, can you uh, can we have our first poll? The demographics. Okay. So, who are you? Tell us about yourself. Fortunately, it's multiple choice and not a text box. We we would <laughs> <laughs> we would know what we would get in there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, we have more than 100 countries. So this is something that makes us very, very happy. And uh, I've never talked to 800 plus people. So uh, it, it's an honor. And uh, we hope uh, that uh, we are going to give you good education and a good discussion so we can learn from you as well. Okay, so almost half of people already answered. So as usual, uh, oh, this time is a little bit uh, dif different. We have 20% only pediatric cardiologists and uh, most of people are CICU, PICU physicians. We have a lot of anesthesiologists and uh, cardiac surgeons as well. And 80% of perfusion, very nice, very nice. Dr. Bartlett, you may be the only general non <laughs> surgeon that's joined us today. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Well, I, I can call myself a cardiac surgeon or an intensivist or a general surgeon or a researcher. So I'll fit in any category. Very good. Again, okay, thank you. So guys, tell us, uh, where are you from? And uh, we thank again our speakers who are from far, far away. Uh, Roberto is from Australia, so it started, it was 11 p.m. for him, and AD is from uh, the U.S. and uh, Gail as well, and from Canada, so it was very early in the morning, and we thank for the speakers and thank all the audience for that. So Latin America is still the, the biggest uh, amount of people, but uh, Asia is uh, quite close. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you very much for that. So we're going to have one question from Dr. Uh, Bartlett, Sasha. Okay, Dr. Butler, can you read your question to the audience? Yes, based on the physiology, what would you say is the best single way to monitor oxygen delivery in relation to consumption in ECMO patients or in any patient for that matter? So this is something that uh, we use on intensive care as well, not only for ECMO patients, but to understand all of our patients Are you happy with the results, uh, Dr. Varshi? Yes, very good. If you're following lactate, you're way too late. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and, and the next one, Sasha, I think is from uh, Hambo. Oh, sorry. Um, which of the following statement of mechanical ventilation during VA ECMO are true? It's a multiple choice. How to, how to ventilate on VA, even on VV ECMO, is uh, quite difficult. Uh, and uh, you are true when you, you say that we have no, no answers. We have some idea of what not to do, but we need to, to understand uh, what to do. Can you comment on, on your question? Yes. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was a multiple choice uh, question. So uh, the main one in appropriate ventilation venti settings can delay ECMO was obviously good. But um, the last one, the abnormal pulmonary function under VA ECMO can lead to Arlequin syndrome uh, was also a good answer. The first uh, answer is not the good because if you have 21% uh, of oxygen, you will, um, you will uh, probably have uh, coronary artery hypoxemia and you will delay your VA ECMO winning. Amazing. So I'd like to uh, have one question for all the panelists, for all the speakers. And this is, I want to start with Dr. Uh, Bartlett. Uh, what is the ideal hemoglobin? 
because we, we have been in an era of uh, very restrict transfusions and, and all of that. And uh, on the physiology, we see the hemoglobin is very important. So what would be the answer for that? So the ideal immobility or mobility? No, no, the hemoglobin, the hemoglobin level. Yes, well, it, it all depends on where you are in the ECMO course. Usually starting out, the patient is probably already paralyzed and you continue with that until everything is stable. And then uh, once you're content that you're managing the patient easily and you could control all the variables, uh, that's the time to certainly reverse the paralysis as soon as possible, then to reverse the sedation as soon as possible to be sure that the brain is working properly that would be at about 24 hours after initiating ECMO. Uh, and then when everyone else is content to uh, manage the patient at rest, that's the time to wake the patient up, start him moving with bed, bedside exercises, then sitting up, then out of bed. We, we're all used to doing this after a week or two or three, but that's way too late. You should be have the patient alert and awake and with a RAS score, if you know what that is, of minus one, uh, beginning at 48 hours and throughout the rest of the management. And, and Gay, you're going to talk about this on your, in your presentation. What are your, your thoughts about this one? My, my thoughts about mobilization? About uh, if how they would be. Open. Yeah. yeah, so I got trained by the guy who looks like Santa Claus up there, Dr. Bartlett. I love the beard, by the way, Dr. B. I haven't seen you. I've spoken to you a lot, but I haven't seen you. So you're looking pretty suave there. I love it. <laughs> so, um, so my thoughts on hemoglobin are variable. Uh, I'm sure that Dr. Bartlett will not disown me. Um, what I do believe uh, is that when you're starting ECMO, you're the purpose is to run the optimal uh, ECMO. And so at the beginning time, when a patient, you got to balance both your flows, uh, ECMO flow, uh, certainly in VV, you're looking at flow and oxygen content of the blood. And so those two things are required to provide adequate tissue oxygenation to the cells. And so in that instance, I always optimize and give them a high hemoglobin at the start of everything. Um, but I think in this day and age, um, and, and so to use a restricted transfusion criteria at the beginning, I think is, is folly because um, sometimes then in order to provide adequate tissue oxygenation, people will increase flow and they will also add in cannulas. And both of those things have their own morbidities and potential uh, catastrophic end results to that. And so if you can use uh, a balance of oxygen content, which is exactly what Dr. Bartlett was speaking about with physiology, and also um, how you use the machinery to, to provide that delivery, so it's content and delivery, then you're gonna get where you need to go. Most certainly in a more prolonged course, once there's stabilization, you can customize that. And you can make a decision that I don't need to keep the hemoglobin two weeks into this run at 15. Maybe I can keep it a little less. Maybe I don't need to transfuse every day. But that's then the whole thing that we now talk about even with anticoagulation, anything else. It's a customization to each patient um, at the time. And it's a decision-making for that particular patient with what you do. These are guidelines that you start with, and I would always start with high hemoglobins, and then I change that as I move on. So it'd be interesting to see that as a study rather than looking at how much blood transfusions are being given in each patient, but rather what do people use in the first 24, 48, 72 hours to gain the stabilization you need to gain to then move forward from there. So Grace, I'm sorry, I did not understand your question. I thought you're asking about mobilization, but you're asking about hemoglobin. I'm so sorry. I, of course, I agree with Gail, but most of the people on this webinar deal with neonates. So they're accustomed to having patients with hemoglobins of 15 or even 17. You're accustomed to dealing patients with cyanotic 
heart disease where arterial saturation of 60% is wonderful. So most of the people on this understand that. A bigger problem comes in the adult world where uh, people are told you must keep the saturation over 90%, but please don't transfuse, it's terrible. So my policy is, as Gail says, uh, when you start out with these patients, they typically are pretty anemic because of their management in the ICU. So they'll have hemoglobins of 10, hematocrit of 30, maybe when you start out. And it's really just, it's okay with high flow, you can deliver enough oxygen, but it's easier just to get the hemoglobin up to at least 12. I always say it should be 15 just to make people think about it. Just think if you're having a problem, this guy says you should make the hemoglobin normal just so people think about it. But usually it's about 12 or a hematocrit about 36%. And, and you can crank up the flow. Those patients will do fine. Uh, and the, the major question comes when you start waking the patient up, if they start getting septic now, you need twice as much oxygen and the one way to go about it is to add another venous drainage catheter and get higher flow, but that has lots of complications, as Gail says, simpler just to transfuse that patient up to a near normal hemoglobin, and then you can uh, manage their increased demand. We have, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bartley. We have uh, a question from the audience, probably for Matteo or even Free, if they, they are not used to work with a transplant patient. If your hemoglobin uh, uh, trigger for transfusion is different on these patients waiting for transplant, or you use the same one? No, uh, there is not a cutoff, uh, but uh, the transfusion uh, during the bridge uh, to lung transplant uh, uh, increased the risk uh, of uh, postoperative complication in terms of uh, uh, there is the risk of. Um, the, uh, increase the risk to product uh, antibodies against uh, uh, the donor lung. So generally, uh, there is a much more restrictive strategies in this patient, but not a reference uh, cutoff value for hemoglobin. Hey, Shri? Yeah, Andrei, thanks. Uh, yep, thank you. Um, again, it, the pre-transplant patients generally will allow them to drip down into the 10, hemoglobin of 10 range. Um, so yeah, again, like Mada was saying, a slightly restrictive hemoglobin transfusion just to avoid um, uh, overexposure and sensitization. The other important thing to remember when we are transfusing these patients is to also maximize the transfusion. By that we mean be generous, use a 15 per kilo if required, so long as it is from the same donor. So you would rather do one large transfusion over four hours, five hours, rather than doing two transfusions from two different donors over time. So that also helps the sensitization part. Okay, thank you. This is very uh, interesting because uh, sometimes our cardiac patients, they are going to heart transplant. We should think about this all the time. Okay, Grace. very good. Sorry, Grace. Okay. Yes. Say it. So now it's time, thanks to uh, this uh, first part, we go to the second part, we move to Australia where we have uh, Dr. Roberto Chiletti, who is the ECMO director and the PCICU consultant at Royal Children's Hospital. Thanks for your uh, time. And uh, we, you will receive a special pack of Italian coffee. for. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty caffeinated by now. <laughs> Roberto, what, what time is it in Australia? Oh, it's uh, nearly 2 a.m. <laughs> That's the usual cannulation time. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for the bell to ring now. Um, thank you so much for the invite, Grace. Um, um, and, and thank you for giving me 10 minutes to talk about one of the most the controversial topics that there are probably in ECMO, which is ECMO for pediatric refractory shock. Can you see my slides? Yes. Beautiful. Um, I have no conflict of interest. I will not be talking about um, anything that has to do with coronavirus in my talk, um, but I will be talking a little bit what we think we know about um, the management of uh, pediatric septic shock, a bit about indication, timing, um, the modality and the type of support. Um, I'll have a, one slide about our recent experience and a little bit talking about what the future direction will be. 
Um, and as Jerome said, there's, um, well, sepsis is still um, a very, um, a very frequent cause of admission in ICU. Morbidity and mortality still remains relatively high. A recent data, these are data from all around the world in different times. Um, the most recent one that definitely um, regards us are the one from Australia and New Zealand, where they have divided also the, um, uh, the outcome and the incident and the outcome based on the clinical presentation based on the recent septic, sepsis guideline between uh, um, an invasive infection, a sepsis and a septic shock with much higher um, mortality for kids who are present with a septic shock. Um, ECMO has been deployed for over 30 years for kids with um, cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory failure. So um, this um, database analysis by Ruth over the um, uh, nearly 10 year, 10 year period showed the deployment of ECMO in kids with uh, sepsis and septic shock. The incidence in the state in those 39 ICU that have been screened for this time was around uh, 5% with a mortality rate that varies through time, but it's been sitting around the 40 to 50%. And in kids that had, um, as this graph shows, and in kids instead with uh, comorbidities, the mortality rate is much higher, up to 60, 70%. Um, and I had a bit of a look um, what data we have. There's actually not really much in the literature in terms of, um, of data about uh, the management of ECMO in kids with the sepsis septic shock. Um, most of the data come from small case series from um, small centers. Uh, and some come, uh, and the larger numbers come from a database report. Um, as you can see, the whole, um, every study um, includes different kinds of patients. Some include neonates, some don't. Um, some um, describe the patient having shock, and some describe them just having a septic kind of picture, or some kind of a pediatric associated arts with sepsis. Uh, not all the centers specify the type of support those kids have received. Um, the amount of kids receiving CPR varies between the groups and the, the inclusion criteria changes. So some, um, some study um, include patients with an oncological disease or immunosuppression and some don't. And that's why the, the survival rates are so variable throughout all the studies and they vary from 30% to uh, the mid 70%. So um, there's still high debate about um, uh, this kind of technology for this kind of patient because mortality rates are still relatively high. Um, and I think one of the biggest problem is in the way we classify things. Um, there is not just one type of sepsis, there's no one kind of uh, sepsis, septic shock. And it's a bit of an um, uh, interaction between an effective organism and, um, and the host immune system. Uh, we know that um, the, um, the cardiorespiratory uh, physiology changes in, with age, with uh, newborns that present mostly with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension or right ventricular failure as sign of septic shock and less as, um, as a left ventricular dysfunction, which is more common in kids uh, in the, um, around the four or five years of age uh, with variable SVR that could be either high or low and compared to adults that present mostly with a um, high cardiac apostate or vasophagic kind of shock. And outcome changes a lot depending on what the etiology of infection is. We know that outcomes are much worse if you have a a fungal or viral infection compared to a bacterial infection. And between bacterial infection, there's large variability in outcomes if you have a gram positive or gram negative infection, or if it's an in-hospital or a community acquired um, infection. Um, plus comorbidities vary in all those in those population. We know that uh, cardiac arrest is associated with worse outcome and, um, and also the presence of severe multi-organ failure. And of course, immunocompromised hosts are the one that have uh, overall worst outcome, especially if they get a cardiac arrest uh, during, their, um, during their admission for septic shock. Um, so what do we know about indication for ECMO? Um, a lot of indication come from, uh, from the surviving sex sepsis campaign, and they just um, describe the, the, de the deployment of, um, of ECMO once uh, all the other therapies have failed. So, once you have uh, reversed your given your antibiotics, you're given your fluid, you start in your inotropes and depending on the type of shock and if you have um, a shock that is res resistant to, um, to catecholamines, that's when ECMO should be considered. But the, le the level of recommendation is relatively weak in, uh, in those guidelines. Um, 
a recent um, a recent uh, publication tried to find if there's any correlation between mortality with the with the development of um, of a score at the better that be able to predict the level of um, of outcome based on um, on three parameters, which is mostly lactate, uh, a visiting visionotropic score, and uh, the presence of a myocardial dysfunction. Um, as you can see, if those scores are two for a bad site score or over 3.5 in a computer, the risk of mortality is over 55%. But if you look at the indication, having a VIS over 200, having lactate over eight, and a my myocardial dysfunction uh, defined as having already have a cardiac arrest or left ventricular ejection fraction less than 25% means that those kids in, in a lot of center probably would already be on some kind of mechanical support. So it's very hard to find the right timing um, for those kids to, um, to think about ECMO. Um, and what we know is that lactate is probably the best um, predictor at this stage on, uh, in terms of outcome either um, of ECMO or on ECMO. Uh, a vasoactive score is not really a good, a good strategy to follow, mostly because it doesn't really um, differentiate between um, a cardiogenic shock or, um, or a distributive shock. So it doesn't really discriminate if you're using pressors or inotropes. Um, echo and monitoring of vascular resistance is probably slowly getting more into the into ICU and bad side echo is actually um, is actually taking place. So I really hope that in time, having more details uh, in terms of the type of uh, shock of those patients might be able to um, allow us better to direct which kind of therapy, which kind of ECMO modality we should be using. Um, and on the other side, also kids that have um, a high risk of, um, of dying, that the risk is never 100%. So they're kids that also not on ECMO survive. Um, and all those data and all those studies talk about survival, while um, there's really little evidence about the use of early ECMO in terms of reversal of multi-organ failure and the improvement of end organ function, and that the impact that it has on length of stay and uh, long-term mobility. Plus, on the other hand, you have to also um, balance what the, um, uh, what the complication could be from, uh, from uh, the use of ECMO. So the risk of secondary infection when you're on ECMO, which is around 15 to 20%, the risk of immunosuppression that you get from being on a circuit, the risk of bleeding and thrombosis and embolic events, plus the difficulty of uh, managing antimicrobials on a, on a circuit and the problems related to your, um, to your can cannulation strategy. Um, I didn't bring much adult study, but this is data from an adult study with, um, which involves the adults that were um, presenting to ICU with the septic shock and uh, which shows that they have much better survival if ECMO was deployed 96 hours from the admission rather than later on, maybe saying that uh, early reversal of organ failure might actually be the way to, to consider ECMO. Um, similar scores with, uh, were designed also on, uh, in Australia. They're from um, um, Australia New Zealand um, Council of Critical, Critical Care. Um, as you can see on the first graph, there, um, there, are, um, there are markers that were taking around the first hour of admission from ICU and the monitor PF ratio lactate level, um, the, the presence of a cardiac arrest of the need of respiratory support, and they give some scores. And if the score was over 12, the predicted mortality were around the 55%, which make you trigger the fact that maybe those were the patients where ECMO support might be, um, might be um, considered. The same group looked also then uh, um, matching those patients with the one that received ECMO. Uh, and what they found that is the predicted mortality based on the scores were over 47%. The, there was a, an absolute benefit around 20% of survival with ECMO compared to patients that had a predicted mortality rate less than 47% where um, the mortality was higher. And they found three um, factors that were um, associated with the outcome. One was lactate uh, during the admission. One was the presence of a cardiac arrest pre-ECMO and the presence of a central cannulation associated with better outcome. Um, this is another study that comes from, um, it's a multi-center study from all around the world, but it's been led from, uh, starting from Australia. And it's a comparative study between patients that received conventional therapy versus um, children that um, received the venous arterial support for septic shock. Indication are the one that you can see here in the, um, in the box. They're quite sick kids. They have a pH less than 7.15 on admission, a lactate over four, and a basic cess more negative than minus 10, or the presence of a cardiac arrest or in the hospital cardiac arrest. 
um, there was no real uh, difference in terms of uh, advantage in sur overall survival in this population with 40% surviving um, for the conventional therapy and 50 for the ECMO. Although this, um, this, um, this difference was much more significant when you look at kids that had a in-hospital cardiac arrest where the difference was between 18% and 42%. Furthermore, they looked at the um, standardizing uh, the, the, uh, the type of therapy based by flow. So they compared the conventional therapy versus low flow of ECMO and high flows of ECMO. And they saw that there was a clear advantage of uh, survival in kids that received um, higher flows of ECMO, ECMO compared to the one that received lower flows of ECMO. And of course, the flows, the level of lactate in the presence of in-hospital cardiac arrest was associated with improved survival in kids receiving the arterial ECMO. Uh, this opens a little bit the, the, the question about, um, sorry guys. This opens a little bit the, the question about um, the quality of support, the adequacy of support during um, venous arterial um, ECMO for septic shock. There's not really much data in the pediatric population. All these data are taken from adult um, uh, patients with septic shock. Um, as you can see, um, the first two studies show how lactate is six hours and lactate at 48 hours or lack of clearance of lactate on ECMO is associated with worse outcome. And another one compares the, um, the presence of um, a high or low mixed venous saturation on ECMO, showing that, uh, that uh, mixed venous uh, less than 60% on ECMO were associated with, with worse outcome, saying that probably um, the quality of support or the adequacy of, um, of uh, oxygen delivery to the tissue uh, on ECMO need to be monitored and, and described to make sure that the outcome is not influenced by that. And that comes then to the way we can manage to get high flow ECMO. Um, we published data a long time ago about the fact that we use central cannulation to, um, to achieve uh, uh, those highest flow in, in kids with septic shock. Um, I think um, there are much more um, usage at the moment of, um, of hybrid uh, methodology that will allow you to get the same amount of flows uh, without needing a central cannulation, which has some kind of um, higher morbidities related to the fact that you have a risk of a sternotomy, which means a mediastinitis and bleeding, uh, compared to kids that are cannulated peripherally. This is um, a paper from, uh, from Grace that describes 10 kids with septic shock. They're all in the newborn period and they achieve high flows by using a double venous cannula and then an, an arterial cannula in the carotid artery, um, which has the potential complication of having uh, cerebral vascular accidents compared to a central cannulation. This is um, just a brief look at the, our runs, which are a little bit the, the continuation from the previous um, uh, 10 years with the Graham described. Um, overall, we had 26 um, kids that were supported with the VA ECMO for septic shock over um, the last decade for a total of 473 runs, so around uh, probably 2% of all, uh, of all our runs. Um, survival rate was around 80% and a large, large amount of kids were cannulated centrally, as you can see, and the overall flows that we were achieving were around 200 ml per kilo um, per minute. A uh, large, large amount of kids received renal replacement therapy on ECMO and um, the lactate at six hours and 12 hours also in a series correlated with worse outcome, saving the kids where you're not able to support with the um, uh, with ECMO in terms of uh, organ delivery, uh, oxygen delivery to the tissue were the one that had worse outcome. Uh, complications, they're, they're present. We have a lot of kids that have surgical exploration when they have an open chest, but the level of hemolysis and circuit chains were relatively small and the risk of mediastinitis and sternal wound infection is still very low. So where, where are we going from here? I think the most important thing is to better define that what, what we consider refractory shock and um, mostly based on the etiology, the clinical presentation and, and try to find some markers of severity and maybe try to find a way we can, uh, we can trigger the, the deployment of ECMO. Ideally, it would be nice to be able to, um, to discriminate between a cardiogenic shock and, um, and a distributive shock and see what kind of modality and cannulation modality would be the best. 
um, I think the timing and modality still remains quite um, quite difficult to to establish. And there's a lot of uh, variability between centers, and we don't actually know if the deployment of ECMO does change the, the systemic vascular resistance and, and might be able to transform a, a cold shock into a, in a warm shock just by activation of the endothelium um, through an ECMO circuit. Um, the big issue is the number needed to treat were very high, so you need a very large studies with a multi-center um, multi involvement when there's really difficulty in, uh, in um, in an approach, um, ECMO approach for those patients uh, overall from the medical point of view and from the ECMO point of view. So overall, ECMO might be beneficial for kids with, um, with the refractory septic shock. It definitely, it's, it is on, in, in our unit, in our, in our country. Uh, the timing for when to start um, ECMO is still unknown. You should probably balance the early reversal of multi-organ failure. So relatively um, early deployment versus the potential risk of complication of having um, some other mechanical support. Um, survival potentially may be better for kids that present with an hospital cardiac arrest. So maybe early support is, uh, is the way to go. Uh, we need to define the better, the better mortality based on the pathophysiology. So either venous -vena support for, for newborns or, or with presence of a pulmonary hypertension and, and relatively conserved left ventricular function versus peripheral VA versus central um, vena arterial support or the presence of um, deployment of hybrid techniques. And, um, and of course, uh, consider your cannulation strategy uh, based on the potential need for higher, higher flows. Thank you. It was amazing, Roberto. Thank you very much. And uh, we, I, I am a true believer of uh, ECMO for, for septic shock. And uh, I'm very happy that you uh, gave us uh, uh, much more information with your talk. Thank you. So before I introduce my dear, dear Gail, I'm going to uh, show you the next activities of uh, Congenital Heart Academy that we hope that you are able to join us. The links for uh, the registration are on our chat box. I'm going to place them uh, again. So this um, Monday, we are going to have uh, a talk with Dr. Mary Cohen uh, about AV canal defects, focusing on the echo. On the Friday, we are going to have a ventricular septal defect with Dr. Uh, Anderson. It's a morphological uh, talk. It's very interesting. Even if you are not a cardiologist, I, I, I highly recommend you to attend because Dr. Uh, uh, Anderson is uh, just uh, amazing and you're going to understand very well um, this uh, pathology. And on this time, you're going to have a talk about uh, the echo uh, on 3D and TEE for uh, this defect uh, by, by a colleague from uh, here, the, the Middle East. And talking about that, uh, we are very, very happy to announce that we are going to have uh, the, our next big webinar that is going to be on the uh, 23rd of uh, July in the same uh, time as this one. And, and uh, it's, it's a joint uh, uh, webinar with the Saudi Heart Association. We are very happy to be uh, together with uh, this very big association here from, uh, from the Arabica Award. And uh, we are sure this is going to be amazing. We are going to talk about uh, 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 tetralogy of fallow. A lot of features, especially on the, on the longer term of tetralogy of fallow. This is going to be a very interesting talk with very good uh, speakers. And we wait for all of you, not the next Thursday, next Thursday, going to be on vacation, but uh, the next one on the uh, 23rd, we are going to have uh, this talk. And then uh, save the data uh, from August on, we are going to have once a month, uh, imaging uh, correlation of uh, morphology and uh, images with Dr. Silverman. This is going to be uh, a very good uh, session as well. And now I'm very happy to introduce uh, Deer again. She is uh, from uh, in Toronto, and she is also um, a project investigator with a lot of uh, research in, 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 this, in the sea kids. And she uh, continued to pursue uh, her, her research on coagulation and CLS. Uh, that's the reason why she's going to uh, talk about uh, uh, anticoagulation and transfusions on, on ECMO. Gail, thank you very much. We really appreciate your. I hope you can actually see my screen. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Perfect. Okay. So I have 10 minutes to tell you everything you need to know about anticoagulation transfusion. And because this is neonatal and pediatrics, uh, I'm just going to go into what's unique about uh, neonates and peds patients for us. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's basically pediatric intensive care in general. Uh, they're not small adults. And at every different age group, we tend to have uh, patients who have variability in how they respond to things. And so when we were talking about the hemoglobin and customization uh, per patient and what they look like and how they respond to your therapies, I think this is the way that medicine in general is going. This is what's really fantastic about practicing pediatric intensive care because we get to learn something new every time we're on and, and they don't follow a particular recipe. And so we have to be alert to that. Obviously, uh, no disclosures or conflicts of interest. I think that uh, I always start out with this, and so it's redundant to some of you who've heard me speak, but um, for those of you who are new to this or who want to understand it more fully, this is a very confusing slide, and that is truly what uh, developmental hemostasis is. But you can see that we have just variability in what we are born with, what we look like at three weeks, at six weeks, three months, six months, and five years. And if you can imagine that just with the hemostatic system, this is also true in terms of pediatric patients for other things in terms of development. Um, I think it's important to just go back to in utero, when does a fetus become some, uh, have the ability to clot and have uh, something that is defined as a coagulation system or a hemostatic system. It's about at 11 weeks of age that we see that. Um, but uh, when we test a neonate at birth, uh, they have both, if we test the neonate, increased risk of bleeding. If we test their cord blood, it's an increased risk for coagulation. So isn't that interesting? The same uh, connection has uh, completely opposing forces that make it either coagulable in the placenta and the cord blood uh, versus bleeding in the neonate. And that's because the, the measures that we use are derived from adult types of populations. We haven't gone out and done a lot in the neonatal or the advancing age groups. And so these next few slides are derived from a paper by Toulon where they did a very good job of, and it's not a lot of uh, patients, but they did a good job of trying to characterize what we're up against when we're doing anticoagulation and we're trying to manage the hemostatic system in a pediatric patient, um, either on ECLS or even not on ECLS and uh, depending on their age group. So if we look from uh, coagulation factors from the neonate and we look from neonate to adult, adult being right over here at the end, we all come to these numbers that we understand or that we know. And so that's interesting. Um, but what's really even more interesting is to see that, you know, the variability and the different factors that we produce that a lot of us now are very interested in, in the uh, ECMO world, and that we now starting to measure, or perhaps we're over measuring. Uh, and, and the understanding is that, you know, a newborn is completely different in their hemostatic production of factors in comparison to an adult. And even when you're anywhere up to 16 to 18 years of age, you are still different and variable compared to an adult. And I won't pick out all the different factors, but I just think that you can see if we would rate it just by numbers and factors and levels, that there's a decreased coagulation potential in a pediatric patient up until they become a full-fledged adult. And where is that adult standard? Uh, I don't have that exact age range, but this is the ranges that were used by Toulon and crew. And so um, here you can see the reference that I've put to this paper. It's very good and it's worth reading. It's all about hematologic stuff, but add into that our hematologic or hemostatic system, how we manage hemostasis and how a neonate or and how a pediatric patient, a toddler and how a teenager manage it is again, very different. So even how we regulate our coagulation and how and when does fibrinolysis occur and what does that look like is variable as well. And so uh, I just have a few of the factors on here, but the only one that really comes up into normal range fast, the most fast is, protein S, one of the ones that we don't pay a lot of notable attention to, but it is important in our regulation of coagulation. 
uh, you can see that uh, plasminogen takes a little while to rise. Uh, tis tissue plasminogen activator is in also uh, incredibly low early on and then starts to rise later on. And again, it takes time over the years for us to get to an adult type of a hemostatic system. And so when we try to compare our antithrombin levels or try to have a standardized approach in a coagulation um, algorithm, uh, the one that we put out in 2014, um, Lawrence Lequie and myself, when we looked at it, we basically threw you guys all a menu on the ELSO website, basically was someone giving you a 30 page menu and you needed to order a dinner from that. And there was so much in it that it was really hard to order a proper dinner. You didn't know what to pair with what. And so I think these guidelines that are coming out now where we've re-looked at it and decided that it is customization, it's more to provide advice, but each center has to have a proper means by which they start to look at things and create an algorithm. And nothing is set in stone and everything requires customization over time because there's always one patient that doesn't follow the routine. So I think just to use the neonate again as an example, when we talk about it, they are far less studied. I mean, they, we could draw a lot of blood out of them and then they, we'd have to transfuse them. Uh, so that wouldn't be good. But I think one of the things that's important is using the neonate, just even looking at their primary hemostasis, something that we do very little of. What we do in terms of primary hemostasis and assessment is we measure a platelet count, that's it. And we only start to measure platelet functionality and things when we start to get concerned about a patient who's bleeding. And now we have some bed, bedside tests that we can use for that. But ultimately, we really have paid very little attention to platelets. And those of you who know me, I'm passionate about platelets. I love platelets. Um, and I've done a lot of studies and work with them. And that's uh, thanks to my mentor and friend, Dr. Bartlett. And when I started out in this business in 1995 in his lab, looking at, at uh, platelets and platelet interaction on extracorporeal technologies. So what we can say about primary hemostasis in the neonate is that they basically have an enhanced primary neo, uh, hemostasis. And uh, they have a higher von Willebrand factor at birth. Uh, they reach these adult values after one year of life. And uh, what is interesting is that there are some differences between non-O and O blood groups. This is something I had not known about it, but there is even that to add to the pickle and to the mix. So they have enhanced primary hemostasis. They have uh, less coagulation factors. So what you have is decreased coagulation potential from the cascade. You have a decreased regulation. You have it potentially an increased fibrinolysis and you have enhanced primary hemostasis. And somehow this allows a normal neonate to be stable in terms of hemostatic response. What we tend to do is not take care of stable neonates on ECMO. And so when they become dysregulated, we are in more of a challenge in terms of how to manage them. So obviously the sickest of the sick end up on ECMO. And this is a slide that I've used over and over again. It's been used by many people now uh, in an approach to just try to give the, the um, most uh, important uh, information regarding what are our challenges and our complications with ECLS. And you can see that hemorrhagic complications are one of the biggest complications. These gray bars down here are every other potential complication, a circuit blowing up, a heat oxygenator going down, an oxygenator going down, anything of anything else, sepsis, infection, so on. Um, but bleeding complications are our biggest worry. And obviously it's become more and more of a worry. And now we're almost over measuring to make sure that we can worry less, but we're actually potentially worrying more. Um, clots are the other thing. So trying to maintain that balance and you can see the majority of our clots happen in the oxygenator, uh, but we do have some that have a significant effect on the patients. And even though it's maybe a small percentage, it's still a percentage. And when an infarction happens uh, in the brain, in the gut, these can be lethal events uh, that you cannot recover from. 
So we measure a lot of things. We usually use a lot of different data to measure. This is just again from Toulon showing some standard measures that we use. Most of us don't use a PT anymore. We use an INR, but it's just to show you again that as we measure these patients across um, you know, different age groups that the, there's variability. And again, that's a standardized, we can't standardize the approach to everyone. One does not fit all. And so we have to understand within the different age groups, what are their responses and where do their values lie? So it becomes tricky to give someone a perfect menu, but more we can provide guidance. So I think that what's come to be known and Renucci and a lot of other people have, have shown this, and we all agree, those of us who are anticoagulation geeks, that the best way to manage someone on ECLS is you have to have an understanding of what your anticoagulant effect is. So that's an anti-10A if you're using unfractionated heparin, because it has the best utility across all age ranges. And uh, if you're using a direct thrombin inhibitor or using some other assay, some people are using now some total thrombin time or a modification of that. Uh, people are using our gatraban levels and other things. But that purely is to tell you at a plasma level, what is the effect of your anticoagulant? What is the best way? The, the other thing that we have to understand is the anticoagulant then gets thrown into the soup with everything else that's causing a problem with the illness, with the response to an artificial circuit, with the patient being hypermetabolic, with the patient having an underlying disease process that requires management and so on and so forth. And so that other test is a whole blood assay. And what can we do for that? So many people have said, ACT is useless, stop doing them. Um, Rotem and TEG have come out. They show us a lot of things and they basically are peeling away all the other different, they're, they're peeling away and they're separating what forms a clot and when, at what point in time do you see fibrinolysis? So I would argue with people who can't afford a TEG or Rotem every day or every six hours, that an ACT is the poor man's TEG or Rotem. And if you have an understanding of those different things, then you have a better understanding of what's happening globally to your patient. And an ACT is comprised of five things, four of them that we can measure. We can measure fibrinogen, we can measure platelets, we can measure a hematocrit or a hemoglobin. And we can also um, measure the, the heparin level, the anti 10 A. We can't really measure real time all of the plasma factors, but we know number five is plasma. And that's a big bag. And it doesn't help us un to understand which factor we need to put in. But if we can rule out that the first four are not a problem, or that we're in good control of those first four, then we know our plasma is the problem and we need to start to think outside the box. That's where you need hematologists to help you and where you start to look at those things. And it gives us the information we know, which is we know our anticoagulant effect, we know our fibrinogen is in good level, we know our platelets are at a good level. We don't know if they're very functional or not, but we know they're at a good level. And we also know that our hemoglobin is at a reasonable level because you do need hemoglobin to help to form that clot. You just need substrate for the clot to be able to adhere to. And so what we don't know is the plasma, but we can from that interpret what are the next steps and work together as a group to make a determination. And it's those really pesky patients who bleed and bleed and bleed or who start bleeding eight or 10 days in that are the ones that we're worried about. Most of the time we can run routine and not ever worry about any of these things that I'm just talking about. So how do we use blood products? What is our blood product use in ECLS? I've listed a whole bunch of them here. Platelets, FFP, cryoprecipitate, some groups still potentially use recombinant factor seven if it's a very isolated bleed frequently after a surgery or in an area where we know it's an isolated bleed or someone who has deficiencies for particular reasons. Prothrombin complex concentrate, much less used, but in some patients used, if we have neurologic emergencies that we feel like we can evacuate a subdural that is causing issues. And then um, other factors, anti-hemolytic factor, von Willebrand factor complex, antifibrinolytic and others. And I can't go into all of those in 10 minutes, but you can look at them. Factor 13 has come to their horizon, more money to spend. I'm not sure if it's important or not. 
Um, but again, you know, the cheapest way to provide any of these factors would be FFP. And yes, that's a blood product. But at this point in time, you are using blood products in ECMO, just to be perfectly clear. Um, and then we have calcium and temperature control. We want to provide local control. Proline I put in there. So surgeons are good. Medical students to apply pressure are good. You can provide some types of uh, quick clot and thrombin glue and stat seals over specific local areas of bleeding. And of course, blood is sometimes needed and we probably should give that too in some patients. This is just uh, coming to the end of my talk here, just a couple of things to remember of what you can give as coagulation factors in plasma. And you can see that there are a lot of them, but you have to remember that they have an in vivo life that is short. We like to give it fresh and not, you know, run it over hours and hours of time, especially if you're trying to abate bleeding. And of course, if you give something such as cryoprecipitate, you have things like fibrinogen and uh, von Willebrand factor, which can be helpful in some patients. And of course, factor eight and factor 13 are also more concentrated in that concentrate. This is the last slide I'm gonna show you. My friend, that I've come to know over time in the anticoagulation world, June Teruya, the group out of uh, Texas, presented this as sort of a means by which we would look at things and targeting our therapies for bleeding and what should we look for? Do we have a targeted therapy? If we do, what is it? And then if those things uh, remain abnormal, this is for them, it's Rotem, perhaps it's TEG, for me, maybe the poor man's ACT, when do I decide to use more exotic and more targeted factors to help to uh, prevent bleeding? Thank you. Thank you very much. You were able to do a lot in your, your timing. Thank you. We learned a lot. And I really like the way that you uh, rule out the most common things when we don't have hot end. In Brazil, we, we don't use it frequently. So uh, it is a good way of, of doing that. Thank you, I've learned. So now we are going to present, uh, uh, to talk to us about something that is very important, that is research on ECMO. Our dear Heidi Dalton, she is the director of the ECLS program, Development and Research at INOVA, uh, North, Northern Virginia, USA, and a member, and a member of the committee of the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium. Thank you, dear. We are really happy to, to have you today. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Can you guys see my screen okay? No, not yet. Okay, give me just a minute. And it should be up. You see it now? Yeah, now we do. We don't see your video. Well, I'm not sure that's any great loss, to be honest, but here you go. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears here with you and talk about research and not necessarily related to ECMO, but I am gonna use the opportunity that the COVID pandemic has given us uh, to go ahead and um, talk about research in a totally different light. And for those of you who haven't seen me or don't know me very well, um, yes, I have been undergoing uh, treatment for cancer. I got my last chemo uh, yesterday. So that's why I am bald, not because I believe in shaving my head every day. I am a consultant for this group, no other disclosures. So I think we have a new disease actually that no one knew anything about a few months ago. And because of that, every piece of new data that has come along, can you see me? We are not on the presentation mode if you want, if you want to click uh, to go in the presentation mode. But we can see your slides in this way as well. Yeah, I think it uh, comes up a little bit uh, better that's this way actually, but I'll flip it there. Uh, so um, early on, these small reports and these small numbers are talking about COVID uh, were what we were managing our patients by. And this has led to a lot of confusion, I think, about symptoms, patient management, treatment, et cetera. And if you look in PubMed, actually, there's about 25,000 articles now on ECMO and about 21,000 already on COVID and about 500 on COVID and ECMO as well. And many of those are single center reports or very small patient numbers. But what we need and what we still need is accurate global data as fast as it can be obtained and shared so that we can learn from others 
and identify best practice and worst practice. And this isn't specialty for COVID, it's for every other type of research that we do uh, as well. And uh, the reasons to do that is because we wanna identify best practice, stomp out worst practice, and we need large scale numbers, geographic diversity, ethnic diversity, uh, and a variety of other things, uh, such as figuring out what places have access to the type of care and management that we recommend, and if they don't, how to fix those problems. So one group that has uh, looked at this globally in the past is the ICERIC group started in 2011. It's actually a database mainly for infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, over 70,000 of these patients come from the UK, but it has provided some global information. And as a uh, outbreak or out, uh, outsource of that is the sprint seri uh, data forms that go along. So whenever some new respiratory viral disease comes up, this can be used to collect uh, sort of high level data on patients who are having uh, these particular types of diseases. Because those uh, aseric and sprint seri don't really focus at all on the ICU, uh, this uh, consortium was born uh, probably in January of this year um, by John Fraser, who is a, a UK, uh, Australia, Queensland uh, investigator. And this uh, group, group called the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium, originally called the ECMO card or the ECMO COVID Acute Respiratory Disease uh, Group, uh, was born to get more specific information on ICU care of these patients, including mechanical ventilation, ECMO, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to read more sort of about it, there's an article in JAMA that was published a month or so ago. Uh, and then the website uh, that you uh, can look at is there as well. But I am going to spend just a couple of minutes uh, talking uh, about um, uh, this group. I seem to have lost my ability to advance the slides. It is a very international group, as you can see here, uh, and uh, we now are in uh, over 350 uh, centers, 50 countries, six continents. And again, uh, you also use data collected with the ICERIC and Sprint SARI forms, so you get a total picture from the patient from the hospital admission uh, through discharge. And you can see here are the countries that are submitting data. Uh, good or bad, the U.S. now tops the list, uh, but certainly uh, the database is growing uh, exponentially on every day. And you can see these are all the centers that are involved as well around the continent. We have a steering committee that is pretty representative of the world. Um, but again, these guys, John Frazier, Juan Luigi Labasi, and Jack Eason are really the uh, headliners behind it. Dr. Bartlett is, of course, our president. And this group actually uh, is also collaborative between ELSO, AP ELSO, that's the Asia Pacific ELSO, uh, and several other groups uh, as well. We have a variety of subgroups and studies that are in progress. Uh, there's a neurologic effects uh, subgroup, cardiac effects, the ECMO group, which I uh, put the, uh, the uh, PIs for that uh, here for you, the coagulation and disorders sub subgroup, I happen to be the PI for that group, so if you wanna be involved, feel free, we have an ethics group and an acute kidney injury group. And then we're also working for data collection and analysis to, to um, work with EHR representatives to download data directly into forms so that we don't have uh, research assistance that are needed. And the IBM project, which I'll talk about more in a minute, is developing a real-time dashboard that you'll be able to click into and find up to the minute data. And then we're also working with Amazon to help streamline how to use uh, Amazon techniques to uh, make data collection faster and easier. There is a dashboard that you can uh, call into anytime and you can look at all of these different uh, parameters uh, and see what's going on there. I just highlighted one of the ECMO ones here for you so that you can look and see maybe what the highest peak airway pressure is, plateau pressure, et cetera, et cetera. And when you click on these boxes, you get medians, uh, and uh, confidence intervals for each of those parameters uh, as well. There's also a new study that uh, we were just on a conference call that's being presented, the after course study, so that these patients actually will be followed up for 24 months because more is coming out about the fact that 
these patients are not well when they come out of the hospital. Uh, and that I think will be a very important study, which we're hoping actually to get funded. Uh, and if you're willing to participate, uh, those are the people that you need to talk to uh, there. Now, having said that, you know, this is not the only registry that's out there, and I want to make that clear. This is data from the ELSO group looking at their data registry, which I don't think we've talked about much today. Uh, and from a couple of days ago, you can see there are over 1,800 patients that have been entered uh, into the ECMO registry who have received ECMO for COVID-19. Again, most of them from the United States, uh, but certainly uh, that database provides information as well. The Euro ELSO group also puts out an ECMO survey every week, uh, looking at the use of ECMO mainly in uh, European countries. And you can see here uh, the trends, they have about 1300 patients in there. About 53% of the patients have been weaned uh, from uh, ECMO. A lot of them are still on, so we don't have pretty specific survival numbers, but 3.5% died on ECMO, 12.5% died after ECMO, uh, and that provides uh, data as well. There is another uh, registry that has come about. This is sponsored by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the Virus COVID-19 Registry, and the NIH recently launched the National COVID Cohort Collaborative called NC3. Again, mainly looking at US populations and they're trying to work with EHR vendors to download data directly as well. WHO actually has a case report form. This is the one for adolescents and children. You fill that out uh, and they have one for adults as well. And then the CDC recently launched a pediatric effort uh, that is headed by Adrian Randolph at Boston Children's that is uh, intended to recruit 30 centers, 800 kids, with a 400 kid substudy to look at biospecimens that are collected for immune response. But what I wanted to really point out is what if we had a scenario where all these efforts work together and we shared all this data? And I know there are a lot of problems with this legally, HEPA, investigators would have to drop their egos and uh, agree to collaborate and all of that other uh, problems that would, might come up. But if we work together, we could also get data downloaded from the EHR. There is no reason we can't do this today. It's blocked by the EHR people. It may be blocked by firewalls and legal in, uh, issues in your own institution. But this is something that if we could do this, think how much time we could save for data collection and money actually for hiring people to do data collection. And if we publish this data on a global web dashboard, uh, we could actually have up to the minute data helping us know what's going on. And so this is the uh, IBM project that the COVID consortium is working on with uh, creating an ICU critical care app. So you could pull this up on your phone, your iPad, anywhere. And you could look at anything that you wanted to know. And you could say, oh, I've got a 50 year old patient. These are his characteristics. What are his chance of survival? What kind of uh, techniques are people using? in this particular type of uh, patient. And if we could do that, then we could find out geographical and global differences in care and outcomes. Again, we could use the EHR to download data and save money and time. And I think if we all work together, this could prevent, present a new paradigm for clinical research that we could all uh, benefit from. So finally, if you're not part of the COVID consortium, I'd invite you to join. If you're doing ECMO for patients, you should definitely be part of ELSA when you should uh, da enter data into the registry, not only for COVID, but for all the patients that you're treating. And then all these other projects, look at them and see if they are right for you. But really, there is only so much data that you can collect uh, in one day. And certainly, we are going to need funding for all of these things. But I do believe that working together, we can accomplish anything. And maybe this is the search for the holy grail, but I do think it's something that we should work towards in the future. And I would certainly invite everyone on the call uh, to join these efforts. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks, Heidi. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Now it's time, uh, uh, Gil, are you on? Can you introduce John? Yes, I, I would love to introduce the next speaker. <laughs> my, uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce John Berger. John Berger is my colleague here at uh, Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Uh, both of us have been doing pediatric cardiac intensive care for longer than we would choose to remember. 
Um, I think the fellows have a series of um, names that they would call us. Uh, the ones that I can say in public are probably Statler and Waldorf, you know, the two guys that in the Muppets that sit up in the, in the bleachers and make fun of other people. John is one of the best intensivists I've ever worked with. Uh, and uh, he wears many hats here, including former and now present uh, medical director of the Cardiac Intensive Care Unit and runs our ECMO program. And he's going to be speaking to us on how to build and maintain a successful ECMO program. John. You're muted, buddy. You're, John, your mute is on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hey, how are you? Uh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Statler, for the nice introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about developing or starting a uh, pediatric ECMO program. I do not have any financial disclosures. I will disclose that I work have worked entirely in an ECMO program that was established in 1984 by my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Billy Short, was actually the first pediatric ECMO center, um, but have been around for the transition from a primarily neonatal program uh, to primarily a cardiac-based program, and was also uh, around when uh, Patty Dalton uh, instituted ECPR in our institution. So some lessons learned from that. Well, I think the first thing that people need to remember is that this is a complex and high-risk procedure akin to uh, launching a rocket into space. Uh, it is both a, it is also a resource intense uh, procedure, uh, both in terms of equipment, financial. I've listed for you some sort of estimates of a cost to uh, establish even a minimal or very small program. Um, and then there's also the personnel cost, not only uh, at the bedside when caring for a patient, but the educational costs uh, for maintaining competencies in the personnel. Um, we have monthly water drills, we do uh, transportation, uh, ECMO transport simulations that require a lot of non-productive time uh, and which has a significant financial impact. Plus, you need all of the other ancillary services, renal, uh, nephrologists, pharmacy, uh, occupational, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, uh, to run a full-fledged uh, ECMO program. And if your program is going to be small, you probably are going to have to do a lot of extra work to maintain those competencies, again, with non-productive time. And it, because if your specialists aren't sitting a pump very frequently, uh, they still need to practice those skills um, to maintain their competencies uh, over time. So sort of the thoughts that I've given to the steps to a full ECMO program, the first is determining the need and the scope of the program, identifying your leadership, establishing your teams, um, developing initial and continuing education processes uh, which is probably one of the more time-consuming and complex aspects. Uh, picking your equipment and establishing other alliances with services. Establishing your key processes and procedures, because standardization for this complex uh, form of therapy is, is key. And then establishing quality measures from day one. So I'll highlight a few of these steps. So the, you know, determining your need. What is the driver for your ECMO program? Is it a pedi new pediatric cardiac surgery program? In which case you can estimate that about one to 5% of the surgeries uh, will require ECMO use. Is it a new adult respiratory program? Can you get estimates of referral out of the hospital for potential ECMO or mortality due to lack of ECMO? All answering this question first is gonna determine how you um, set up your program. So for example, if it's a pediatric cardiac surgery program, it may be a perfusion-based specialist program, uh, uh, realizing that the numbers will be small. Also important considerations are, are there other regional uh, resources? Are there other centers nearby that are either competitors or collaborators? And that can um, influence whether you're going to start a program. And be incremental. 
you don't want to start uh, doing this with um, um, uh, CPR, ECMO for CPR resuscitation um, as, a, as the first um, patient. Um, start simple uh, and work up the complexity chain. Uh, what if the need is small? There are other models of uh, ECMO provision. You could refer to a regional center, you could actually partner with a regional center uh, where they would come do remote cannulation with an then ECMO transport. Um, for the center, there's obviously lower financial risk because you're not taking on all of the uh, costs associated with ECMO, but you are taking on the risk for a patient of transport either on ECMO or off ECMO. Um, and transporting a critically ill patient who may or may not eventually end up on ECMO um, is a consideration. Um, and emergent ECMO transport and remote cannulation is difficult. It is possible, it takes a lot of practice. Um, most of the ECMO transports that I have been involved with over my uh, year um, usually takes a day or so to set up and they're not set up in a couple of hours. And I think importantly, when you're referring patients out, uh, there is the loss of family and community support for that patient. Uh, which I think is very important for recovery. Another model of ECMO that uh, I have seen and I think is a great uh, model for small volume centers is sort of a hub and spoke or ECMO light model where ECMO is initiated locally and then the patient is electively transferred for longer term care. This would be particularly appropriate for a small volume pediatric cardiac surgery program um, or other small volume centers. It provides for efficient use of the resources at the small, small volume centers um, while extracting and, uh, the experience of high volume centers. And that, that experience can be in such things as patient ambulation, uh, ventilatory management, need for renal uh, replacement therapy, uh, as well as the ability to trans transition to other mechanical support devices in patients who have uh, cardiac ECMO. It does, however, require a very strong partnership agreement uh, such that um, everybody uh, is uh, happy with the arrangement. Um, so once you've determined the type of program you knew, you're going to need uh, to establish your leadership structure, um, decide where the home unit or service will be for this. Uh, uh, there should be a medical director who has training or experience in ECLS, um, uh, preferably uh, more than a few years. Uh, you'll need an ECMO manager who's going to be responsible for uh, uh, the specialist team uh, and the maintenance and uh, understanding of policies and procedures as well as equipment. I think also it's important to find, figure out who your cannulation director is going to be, if that's going to be a general surgeon or a cardiac surgeon or a radiologist or a cardiologist um, or an intensivist, depending on the type of program. Um, these three directors are going to need to get buy-in from hospital leadership, blood bank, laboratory, pharmacy, uh, and all of the other ancillary services to make the program successful. Um, and, and why is that? For example, in our institution, uh, for a long period of time when we started using uh, TAG for monitoring anticoagulation, the laboratory would only be able to provide that Monday through Friday, um, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And obviously that doesn't work well for an ECMO patient when you need it on the weekend. And then I think, very importantly for young programs um, is to uh, find a partner institution and or uh, other local expertise that can uh, be a consultant, can be uh, a coach, can help um, really br bring the programs along. Uh, in this day and age, um, we don't wanna be experimenting on ECMO patients. And then finally, uh, ELSO has a lot of resources, um, both for uh, 
training diagrams and uh, guidelines in terms of policies, procedures, um, and should be um, uh, looked upon as a very valuable resource for program development. Um, the other, once the leadership is established, it's important to establish the teams. And I emphasize the, the S in teams. When we think about ECMO, it really isn't a single team. It's, it's bringing together three teams, the patient care team, uh, the cannulation team, and then the primers and ECMO specials. And these groups often don't work in the same environment uh, or may or may not work in the same environment. And they're brought together in a high risk situation that has time critical procedures. And so uh, simulating and establishing the relationship of these teams is equally as important as establishing the teams themselves. And this was brought home to me uh, during one of our initial debriefings after an ECPR simulation. And one of the bedside nurses, uh, ICU nurses, made the comment that the resuscitation was very orderly, calm, uh, and precise until we hit the ECMO button. Uh, and with the introduction of the two other teams, there was a lot more chaos in the room. Um, and so I think it's important to, you know, simulate to bring, to integrate these three teams. The other important aspect of it is to really focus on who your cannulators are going to be. Um, because that's, um, that technical skill is not practiced very often by uh, folks other than cardiac surgeons who it's a daily process for them. Um, and that's going to influence your patient outcomes significantly. Um, we have in our own institution, uh, transition from general pediatric surgeons doing cannulations uh, to an entirely cardiac surgeon-based uh, cannulation strategy, um, primarily because our general surgeons were not uh, doing it frequently enough anymore. Um, and so it's, it, it is an important aspect to pay attention to. Um, once you're establishing your teams, you know, Education of these teams is going to be uh, critical. You're going to need multiple modalities, both didactic lectures, uh, texts and references, checklists, but also water drills, simulation, and practice, practice, practice. Um, for establishing our ECMO transport service, uh, we had at least six months of simulations um, to understand uh, how to put all the pieces together, where to put the patient, where to put the pump, how to get through elevators in different places, um, how to get in and out of an ambulance with an ECMO circuit. Uh, initial training of the uh, uh, key team members should occur at an experienced center or at an ELSO sponsored course. Uh, again, having consultation with an experienced center is very helpful uh, and being part of ELSO. Uh, ELSO has many uh, training manuals and uh, 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 educational resources um, that are very uh, important. Uh, you want to establish uh, strict procedures and checklists. 75% um, of, uh, of ECMO machine complications are results of human error. Um, again, this is a complex care and so a high level of standard standardization. Key areas to have written procedures are obviously cannulation, pump setup, pump safety checks and circuit checks, uh, anticoagulation, uh, patient movement, laboratory monitoring, just to mention a few. And you want, again, want to be incremental in what procedures you are uh, doing and what aspects of ECMO you are considering. You do not want your first ECMO patient to be a rocket uh, blowing up on the launch pad will set your program back uh, considerably. And, and I just uh, share this. This is uh, the uh, roles and duties of all the different participants in our ECPR program. Each, each color represents a different person in a different stage. Uh, and you're not meant to read it. It's just to highlight how complex this is. And so, um, making sure that you've got well outlined procedures uh, before accomplishing something like ECPR 
is key. And then the final, the final thing is that you should set out quality metrics uh, beginning day one of ECMO. Um, the ability to benchmark with ELSO or other uh, referral centers. Uh, I think that the, one of the key areas uh, for uh, standard quality uh, monitoring is certainly anticoagulation. Um, and I'll share some, uh, some of our work in that uh, in the next slide but also how often you're accessing the circuit, how often there are mechanical failures, um, and the, as well as other standard critical care measures. Are patients developing uh, pressure sores uh, because of the uh, fear of moving them, et cetera. Um, and then finally, I think it, particularly when starting out, you should debrief all cannulations and decannulations. Um, there should be a leadership review of the entire run um, and, and any debriefing of any uh, major complications. Again, uh, as Gail emphasized, anticoagulation, um, I think, has gotten actually more complicated as the uh, time has gone on. Uh, bleeding and thrombotic complications are very frequent. Uh, because of that, we instituted a new heparin protocol a couple of years ago um, that involved the use of um, uh, TAG and uh, anti-10A levels, as well as uh, very stricter guidelines in terms of heparin management. Um, and with that, in an experience center, we reduced our component changes uh, from 15 to 16 percent of runs. We reduced our transfusion requirements, red blood cells by 17 percent, platelets by 44 percent, and the FFP by 41 percent. Again, we are in an experience center. So in conclusion, um, the key takeaways are making sure that you have a firm understanding on the needs and scopes of your program, uh, having uh, uh, robust educational uh, um, processes and practicing, finding a partner, and taking advantage of the resources uh, by ELSO. And thank you very much for the time to speak today. Thank you. It was a really, really nice talk. And uh, we all know how difficult it is to set up an ECMO program. And it was very uh, helpful for everybody, I'm sure, about that. So now to wrap up our meeting today, we are going to talk about quality of life after ECMO. And uh, we are going to have two speakers to, to this talk. And the first one is going to be Kion Ali. She is from Chicago, and she is now the interim medical director of uh, the Registering uh, Cardiac Care Unit. And she's the med medical director of the Single Ventricle Center of Excellence and associate director of the NICU Cardiac Developmental Program and the Cardiac League lead of the ECMO program. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Kiona, for accepting to, to speak to us. And uh, uh, we are going to, to have your quality of life uh, uh, after ECMO now. Thank you. So can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk more about uh, neurodevelopment and then the next speaker is going to uh, pull that into quality of life because those two things are obviously very interrelated. I have no disclosures. Um, so I'm going to talk about the scope of the problem risk factors for neurodevelopmental difficulties and give you a little bit of data about outcomes and um, some of the steps that we're taking to improve outcomes. So as everyone knows, uh, outcomes in congenital heart surgery and ECMO mortality have improved over time. And so there's been a paradigm shift to focus more on long-term morbidity in our patients. We know that 10 to 20% of pediatric patients will experience neurologic sequelae um, that can result in long-term functional impairment. So our, our patients, parents, and we providers alike have demanded increased attention to long-term neurodevelopmental, psychosocial, and quality of life outcomes with two major areas of attention, promotion of cardiovascular fitness to maximize physical health and functioning, and then prevention of neuronal injury and promotion of healthy brain development to maximize neurodevelopmental and psychosocial functioning, or in simpler terms, the interaction between heart and mind. 
in 2012, the American Heart Association published a consensus statement outlining risk factors for neurodevelopmental delays in the congenital cardiac population and surveillance and management strategies that uh, hopefully will help us start to optimize outcomes. They identified a population of patients at particularly high risk for developmental difficulties, which include children who need open heart surgery in infancy, children with prolonged periods of chronic cyanosis, even if they don't require open heart surgery, and children with congenital heart disease and other morbidities that confer additional risk. Those additional comorbidities include uh, prematurity, developmental delay observed in infancy, underlying genetic syndromes, um, exposure to ECMO or VAD, history of heart transplant, history of CPR, post-op length of stay greater than two weeks, perioperative seizures, and abnormalities on neuroimaging. Um, children with congenital heart disease who require ECMO then are immediately labeled as high risk. And perhaps more importantly, the need for ECMO may cluster with a number of these other risk factors that create a cumulative burden that worsens the risk profile. We've all seen patients where the need for ECMO is the start of a series of unfortunate events that lead to progressive ICU-related morbidity, even if it doesn't end in mortality. And so in knitting together the various studies of various populations of children with congenital heart disease or cardiomyopathy or ECMO or whatever the population may be, it's clear that the causes of CNS sequelae are cumulative and interactive. So this includes patient preoperative factors, some of which are present even in utero, abnormalities in fetal blood flow, maternal stress, birth weight, gestational age, which impact both the severity of your CHD outcome and also um, in many cases your ECMO outcome, and then global morbidity and the sequelae of heart disease. So, you know, chronic cyanosis, malnutrition, cardiac arrest, cardiac interventions, perioperative hemodynamic instability, all of that leads to cumulative neurologic injury. And while even children who were previously healthy and go on to ECMO acutely, for example, kids with myocarditis who were healthy before they get sick, um, those children can experience neurologic sequelae too, but the vast majority of children who acquire cardiac ECMO are children with congenital heart disease, 73% in the ELSO registry data from 2014. Um, and so those children are already at increased risk for neurodevelopmental difficulties just due to their underlying diagnosis, and the ECMO is just the cherry on top. Patients with more severe congenital heart disease are more likely to have neurodevelopmental difficulties and are also more likely to be sick enough to require ECMO. Studies of long-term neurologic outcome in ECMO patients uh, report a huge range in outcome. This is likely related to a heterogeneous population and a heterogeneous way of classifying that outcome. Um, but unlike many of our studies looking at um, short-term neurologic outcomes in ECMO, the long-term studies are a little bit more limited in how much data we have. What is clear is that patients with more complex congenital heart disease and a more complex disease course have a higher likelihood of developing a more severe disability. So what does that uh, disability look like? What is the neurodevelopmental phenotype that we most commonly see? So this is again, extrapolating from the general congenital heart population of which most of the ECMO patients we're talking about are, um, they tend to have mild cognitive impairment. So a normal to slightly decreased IQ and academic achievement, but the majority are still in the normal range. Uh, diminished fine and gross motor skills, decreased visual construction and perception, impaired core communication skills and social interaction. And this includes an increased prevalence of autism poor executive functioning, inattention and increased impulsivity with uh, an increased uh, prevalence of an ADHD diagnosis, and then increased incidence of psychosocial maladjustment and psychiatric disorders, including anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress in both the patients and their parents. So the cognitive impairment um, patients with congenital heart disease have been shown to have mild mild cognitive uh, impairment. And this, again, typically manifests as a slight decrease, in, slight decrease in the mean IQ, but a substantial skew to the left with the number who have um, two standard deviations or more below the normative mean. So that's consistent with moderate to severe disability. That number is greater, even though the majority of children are still 
um, uh, achieving an IQ score in the normal range. Um, the Boston group compared matched cohorts of congenital heart disease surgical patients with uh, who did not require ECMO with those who did require ECMO. And while both groups scored lower than the normative population, the ECMO Since the majority of children will actually have an IQ in the normal range, these deficits can be subtle and require formal testing. And then as kids get older, these cognitive issues are reflected in the impaired executive function and attention that we see on neuropsych testing in older children. So while it's good that many of them have IQs in the normal range, the problem is that these subtle deficits are often not picked up um, by school personnel or um, by a lay person. And actually there's some data that even though um, children with executive function uh, difficulties uh, should qualify for school services, the vast majority of them are not currently receiving them. And that the patients who have more issues with impulsivity and attention are the ones who are getting services, probably because they're actually disturbing the teacher and the teacher needs them to be getting services in order to conduct their class. Whereas children who are more um, distracted or have issues with organization and time management and some of those issues may be written off as uh, lazy. Um, and that is certainly anecdotally what we've seen in our cardiac neurodevelopmental clinic. Um, the severity of the underlying cardiac disease appears to be the primary driver of the effect here. There is actually a study from the Holland ECMO registry that found a normal mean and distribution of IQ in VA ECMO patients at eight years of age. These were non-cardiac patients who went on for um, things like meconium aspiration and congenital diaphragmatic hernia, acute respiratory failure. So it doesn't seem to be, there's obviously a lot of concerns about cannulation strategy and the risk of neurodevelopmental injury, hemorrhage and stroke and those kind of things, but it may not be the ECMO itself that's conferring the additional risk. If you have a good run, it may be the underlying cardiac disease that's driving most of that. Um, similar to cognitive impairment, fine and gross motor impairment is common in children with congenital heart disease uh, with or without ECMO, but is often subtle. Um, it's common to see developmental delays and abnormalities in tone and coordination in infancy and early childhood. We've certainly seen that in the Boston circular arrest, circulatory arrest study data, for example, and a bunch of other cohorts of congenital heart patients. Um, this appears to be largely associated with the complexity of the clinical course particularly prolonged length of stay, which certainly applies to a number of our ECMO patients and highlights the need for early mobility and aggressive rehab in ECMO survivors, not just the ones who are VV and waiting for a lung transplant, but all, all ECMO patients. Um, because they're at a higher risk for acute neurologic injury, you might expect ECMO survivors to have a higher prevalence of severe disability. And while it is higher than the general CHD population, moderate to severe disability is still pretty rare. Um, a study of 95 pediatric cardiac ECMO patients from Pittsburgh showed 75% of patients had only normal to mild disability at hospital discharge. And that actually improved over time with 81% normal or mild disability at two year follow-up. So most of our patients are independently mobile and can manage their age appropriate activities of daily living as they approach school age, but they may have some difficulties with movement and coordination and visual motor integration. Um, these deficits, while they again may not be obvious to a lay person, have been shown to predict future academic achievement and may sort of be the canary in the coal mine that, um, that shows you that multiple academic and neurodevelopmental domains are at risk. Uh, there's also some significant psychosocial impairment, which includes issues with higher level communication, social cognition and the ability to develop peer relationships. There's a higher prevalence of autism and also a higher prevalence of mental health issues in both the patients and the parents, including anxiety, depression, and um, PTSD. Um, and this just is a little bit more concrete, uh, highlighting the data that I just spoke about, the, an increase uh, odds of autism, ADHD, and specific learning disabilities, as well as actually intellectual dis global intellectual disability. So what does it actually mean for our highest risk CHD patients, ECMO obviously being included in that category? 
one in six students will be placed into substantially separate classrooms. One in five students um, will have to repeat a grade at least once. One in four students require occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, and or some kind of psychiatric services. One in three students will require some kind of special education programming, which maybe isn't a substantially separate classroom, but maybe like an, an aid in or pull out services. And then one in two students will have attention and or hyperactivity issues, not necessarily a full diagnosis of ADHD, um, but some issues with impulsivity or attention or what, what have you. Um, and so what this means is that we have to do better and that we know that the burden of neurodevelopmental, psychosocial, and physical morbidity has a direct impact on health-related quality of life, which um, we're gonna talk about in more detail in a minute. But studies have shown that gross motor ability, mood, and executive functioning account for 50% of the variance in quality of life scores in children with cardiac disease, which suggests that interventions targeted toward neurodevelopmental and psychosocial outcomes may have a significant impact on quality of life in this population, perhaps as much as interventions focused on cardiac medical morbidity. So we all need to divert more attention and resources to nurturing neurodevelopmental and psychosocial resilience because that's probably gonna have the largest impact on the long-term outcomes that matter to patients and families. So the goals then are to diagnose developmental delay and disability, which requires surveillance screening, and then starting to develop treatment algorithms for these issues, and to put interventions in place to maximize that long-term outcome, including quality of life, educational and vocational attainment, and, and reducing the incidence of um, psychosocial and mental health difficulties in the patient and the family, so that these families can thrive and our children can transition to independent adult life. The recommendations right now through that AHA guideline are referral for formal developmental evaluation, um, early on with um, also through a dedicated neurodevelopmental program, but also referral to whatever local services there may, may be, whether it be early intervention or children who are a little bit older to special education services through their local school district, um, even before confirmation of a specific developmental diagnosis. And then periodic reevaluation, um, because we've seen that uh, the lack of, of difficulties, the lack of identifiable difficulties early on does not necessarily mean that there will not be difficulties identified at a later date. Um, programs like the one at Lurie um, need to be offered to high-risk cardiac patients. Ours is rolled into the NICU um, because that, that um, population has been getting screening for a long time. And obviously there is some overlap. Some of those patients also will have been exposed to ECMO even without cardiac disease. Um, and what's increasingly clear is that um, these clinics need to service children, not just in infancy, which has been the traditional model, but to follow them through adolescence as so that we can pick up more of these executive function and more subtle difficulties that affect school performance. Um, psychological services is really important. Um, rehab and um, developmental therapies are important. Dietitian um, support, nutrition support, social workers, and then um, many programs, this is hard to, to actually accomplish practically speaking because it obviously isn't covered by insurance, but having a dedicated educator who can interface with the school, whether it be the developmental pediatrician embedded in the clinic or a dedicated education liaison is really important for families not to feel like they have to advocate for themselves without any support in these school meetings. It can be a, a huge power differential between the school and the family and many schools still don't really understand this yet. Um, I'm hopeful that um, the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Outcome Collaborative just finished its um, collection of data for the last year from um, the early childhood clinics that are part of the collaborative. So we're hoping to have data about uh, some of the neurodevelopmental outcomes that we are seeing in cardiac patients, including ECMO patients. And it's about to open data collection for the older um, child and adolescent group as well. So hopefully we'll have more long-term data um, that we can share soon so that we have more idea of what's actually happening to our patients. Oops. Thank you, Kiona. It was uh, an amazing uh, overview of uh, the real uh, you know, follow-up of this uh, 
child and thanks a lot because the perspective is uh, very clear and I think that people will uh, learn and I learn a lot from you. Thank you very much for such an amazing uh, presentation. Now we go ahead and we finish directly from uh, uh, Canada, from uh, the Solary Children's Hospital with uh, Gonzalo Garcia Guerra, who is a senior consultant at Edmonton uh, in Canada. And again, he will talk, uh, will tell us about quality of life after ECMO in children. Thank you, Gonzalo, for your patience also. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor for me to actually be invited to talk to all you guys and, and have Dr. Bartlett on the same webinar. I'm just going to put my uh, slideshow here. Can you guys all hear me? Perfect. Perfect. So, um, as uh, has been mentioned, I'm going to talk about health related quality of life after extracorporeal life support or ECMO. Um, and, uh, you know, has been shown in the previous slides, we know that we can take a very acutely ill children with a very high likelihood of dying to actually survive the ICU and eventually take him, uh, get him out of the hospital. And we are very successful with this amazing intervention to do this in around 50% of uh, the patients, depending on the indications. However, I am uh, a strong believer that we have to uh, achieve and, and our goal should be beyond survival. Uh, I think we have the obligation and the duty to provide this care with a minimum amount of pain and suffering for our patients. So to provide comfort during our care, do this with a minimum amount of complications and also to give these patients the opportunity to achieve their maximum potential later in life. So that means not just get them out of the ICU and surviving, but also uh, help them to achieve their goals in life and have a happy and meaningful life later on. And this is a patient of us uh, that have uh, MRSA sepsis and cardiac arrest that eventually was able to get back to her own life. And I think that's what we should try to do with every single one of our patients. As has been discussed, we know that ECMO has several complications, but I think it will be very unfair to blame ECMO and all the complications and all the things or the bad outcomes that these patients may have. So the first times that I started talking about this topic, uh, I got criticized because people thought I was giving a negative view of it. I'm not saying that, you know, this is, a, as I said, an amazing intervention that will make a lot of patients who are very likelihood of surviving to get home. Uh, but I, and I know that some of the uh, issues and complications that these patients have are not related to the ECMO itself, but they might be related, as has been mentioned in the previous um, uh, talks, to the disease itself or related to the disease process uh, and ECMO is only one more aspect of it. So as I say, we have to, um, our goal should be beyond survival. And you know, when you look at survival it has improved in the last years, but we kind of plateau. And I think there's still some room to improve survival, but where we have a lot of room to improve is beyond survival in their uh, long-term outcomes. And one of the main uh, long-term outcomes is our patient reported outcomes is how the patients actually feel about it and how they go, they go on with their own life after uh, surviving uh, their ICU and their ECMO. So for this, one of the main outcomes as has been mentioned by Q&A is health-related quality of life. For those who are not related with the concept, it means uh, it's a multidimensional construct that includes physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just merely the absence of disease. It refers to the person's subjective and emotion, emotional evaluation and reaction to his or her health condition. And this is very important because it is a subjective outcome. It's not an objective outcome, but it relates to how the person feels about its own health. And um, the, it's been well described in many, uh, in many uh, papers that the clinical condition or the severity of the disease is not necessarily associated with the perception of quality of life. And because of that, we as physicians are very poor actually uh, trying to uh, determine what is the quality of life of our patients later on. So how we measure herbal-related quality of life in pediatrics is a bit of a challenge. Uh, there are many instruments out there. The majority are questionnaires that the parents uh, for little kids or the patients itself or older kids can answer, 
But as you can see already, we have different ages, so we have different instruments, depends on how old the patient is. Uh, but the majority of them, they will give you a total score and they give you some subscores uh, that reflect some of the domains that are related to the quality of life of a person. So one of the most common use and most of the studies that I'm gonna refer to uh, and that have been done on ECMO survivors, they use the PSQL um, score, which has a, a scale that goes from zero to 100 and which higher scores indicating better quality of life. So what is out there? Um, there's around 12 studies looking at pediatric health-related quality of life after ECMO. So not many there. Uh, I wish I had time to go in detail uh, through each one of them, uh, but obviously I don't. So I'm just gonna summarize uh, the evidence of all of them and also then highlight after a few points of some particular studies that I would like just to, to show you. So the, the majority of the studies that are out there on quality of life after ECMO uh, have a relatively small sample size. They go from 12 to 95, and 95 is just for one neonatal study. And the majority of these studies have a patient population or a cohort that is between 20 and 40 patients. So quite small studies. Um, half of these studies are in the cardiac patients. Uh, there is, uh, if we leave the neonatal population aside, um, there is very little information on quality of life for non-cardiac ECMO survivors. Um, the majority of the patients have gone on ECMO on a early age, uh, sorry, very early in their lives, and with a, a mean age usually below two years. The average time for the assessment of the quality of life is seven years, and that highlights, you know, we get a view on how they do early in life, but there's no many studies seeing at the whole progress, as Kuna mentioned uh, before, in terms of how they do later in their teenage years and eventually how they do when they get into adulthood. Uh, only seven of the studies, so how about half of the studies, are looked in some factors associated with quality of life. So we can actually try to do intervention to see which things that we can actually modify to improve the quality of life of our patients. So in general, what all the studies show is that ECMO survivors are at risk for low health-related low quality of life. And I'm gonna give you a few details on that in the next slides. So one of the first uh, studies that was conducted was Vascotello, and they look at cardiac patients uh, who needed ECMO and they compare them to a normative sample, so healthy children and children with cardiac disease, but, they did, but who did not need ECMO. Um, they found lower scores in the, in the ECMO survivors compared to the healthy population. Uh, but one of the things when you look at this study is, is actually the patients who survive ECMO have similar outcomes. So with patients that had a Fontan procedure and, uh, but did not need ECMO. So they kind of per performed lower than the healthy population, but they have similar outcomes compared to other patients that needed quite intensive therapies and have a complicated course. Um, as was mentioned before uh, by Kiona, attention deficit, uh, epilepsy, speech problems, and hearing deficits were quite common on uh, this cohort. And I'm not going to talk right now because I will do it later about risks for lower quality of life. Um, the biggest study that is out there is about uh, Motherom, and uh, this is the one that includes 95 neonates, mainly are kids with respiratory diagnosis that were put on ECMO on the first day of life. Huge survival, as you see, for most of the ECMO. Um, sorry, hold on a sec. Your slides aren't advancing on, on the call. They are not going? No, we've only been looking at your first night call. For some of us, they are. Like, I can see, I've seen them advancing the whole time. I can see them can fine. You, can you guys see them? Some people can and some can't, it sounds like. I can see them as well. And then uh, unshare and share your screen again. Because for, for me, it's normal, but a lot of people are not able to see it. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay, so I don't know how to fix that if some people are seen or not. Do you want me to close and open again the slideshow? I think so. Okay, give me a minute then. Sorry. If that doesn't work, Gonzalo, unshare the screen and then we'll go back. Your next okay. talk will be quality of slides. Okay, let me see. Can you guys see it now? Yeah, for me, it's normal. Let's see. Okay, let's see how this goes. 
Um, so where I was, I got lost. Getting now. a lot of we're getting a lot of positive responses, Gonzalo. Thank you very much. Perfect. So as you can see in the neonatal population, and you know, huge survival compared to you know to the cardiac and pediatric cardiac and respiratory patients. And uh, but what I found interesting in this uh, in this uh, paper was uh, when you look at the report of quality of life comparing the child report to the fathers and mothers of these patients, actually the children uh, rated their quality of life lower than their parents, which is kind of unusual. In most of the studies uh, for other uh, issues, you're gonna see that the child, the children actually report their quality of life a bit higher than what the parents think it is. So I thought that was quite interesting and a bit unique from the ECMO survivor population. And the fathers were a bit uh, more positive and they rated them higher than the mothers. Um, when uh, this, I wanted to show you this paper as well from uh, Torres Andres, uh, which uh, actually look at survivals, ECMO survivals after eCPR, and they had 558 patients. And interesting things from their study was that none of the out of hospital patients survived to follow up. And you know, based on this data and from others, it's one of the reasons why at our center we do not offer eCPR for out of hospital cardiac arrest. And the other thing that they found that this was also um, common with other studies is that normal imaging was actually uh, associated with higher total and physical uh, health-related quality of life. Um, the next one is a study from uh, Elias. Uh, this is a small study, um, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight on this one is they compare cardiac patients that needed ECMO with a healthy population. So you're gonna see on the left-hand side um, you're going to see the, the ECMO patient survivors. And then if you go towards the right, the next column show you, you the healthy population. So of course, the uh, ECMO survivors have lower heart-related quality of life scores, meaning poor heart-related quality of life compared to normal children. But if you keep moving along to the right, you're going to see that when you look at kids with mild congenital heart disease or more significant, and you go all the way to the kids with single ventricle physiology, they actually don't score much different. Again, when you look at the report from children and report from parents, uh, you're gonna see that they uh, score less than the normal population, than the healthy population, and the children are actually scoring themselves lower compared to their parents. Then I wanted to share with you this study from, uh, from Italy, from Di Leo, and actually what I found interesting on this one is their follow-up for heart-related quality of life. I mentioned at the beginning that is in, in average is around seven years of age, but this study actually followed patients 10 years after their ECMO run. So the majority of their uh, patients, although a small sample, it is actually uh, there in their teenage years or their early adulthood. So what they found is for the survivors, uh, the 10 years later, except one patient that has spastic quadriplegia, the rest were independent, uh, were living independently, and they were actually in school or finished school, and they were working or in university uh, degrees. So I've, it seems from this one, although it's a small sample, that uh, those who survive a long time, they actually do quite well. This is our study that now is a bit old, it's from six years ago, and we're hoping that in the next, uh, in the next few months we'll get actually new data from the last few years. But what we did is we look at our cardiac uh, patients that needed ECMO support at the age of less than five years. And then uh, we compare them again with a healthy sample. And, and we found that their heart related quality of life was significantly lower in all domains. And keep in mind, these are early uh, patients that needed uh, ECMO early in their lives. And this difference is not just statistically significant, but when you look at the minimum clinical important difference, so that difference that actually will make patients to actually go for a treatment of our intervention um, to try to improve this number, you're going to see that more than 50% of the patients were scoring below this clinically uh, meaningful difference. So I think that's very important to keep in mind. Um, we also look at risk factors, but I say I'm going to comment that on the next uh, few slides. So I don't like actually call them risk factors. I think they are factors associated with her related quality of life. But I think is we can divide them probably in those that we can actually not change and those factors that maybe uh, we can change to improve the quality of life of our patients. 
Um, so we have found when you look at all these cohort of studies, um, the common things that come up is, you know, chromosomal abnormalities are definitely a risk for lower heart related quality of life. And we can definitely not change that one. Younger age at the time of ECMO, except one study and all the other ones have been associated with uh, poor heart related quality of life. The longer the bypass run is, the number of non-cardiac surgeries that the patient receive uh, also has been associated with lower quality of life. And maybe in the list of the ones that we can actually do something and try to modify them in the, in the acute setting is the need for high enotropic support in the first 24 hours, probably meaning that our support um, to try to achieve good oxygen delivery might not be enough. Um, so that might be a modifiable factor because higher inotropic support in the first 24 hours has been associated with poor heart related quality of life. The longer the ECMO run is, and maybe trying to identify those things that we can change uh, to stabilize the patients and get them off ECMO quickly uh, will be an area to, of improvement. And it has been mentioned by QNA, brain injury uh, definitely has been associated with uh, lower heart related quality of life. And there is a few studies looking at those who have a normal CT scan in general that has been correlated with a better uh, quality of life outcomes. Longer PICU and hospital stay also have been associated with the lower heart related quality of life. And it has been mentioned and very well studied in the cardiac population. This is not just related to because how sick the patients are, but I think the longer they stay in the ICU and the longer they stay in the hospital for pediatric patients actually has a detrimental effect on their development and their quality of life. So uh, again, early mobilization and a lot of the uh, ICU liberation things uh, are really important to try to improve in this area. Disabilities, as uh, Kiona mentioned, also have been related with lower heart-related quality of life. And in the neonatal population, the development of chronic lung disease also has been associated with uh, poor quality of life. Uh, which domains are more affected? You know, we, we say overall, we know that these patients have lower uh, health-related quality of life, but which areas are more affected? The psychosocial aspect of it, so psychosocial summary scores have been uh, particularly low. Uh, issues from behavior and attention deficit, as Kiona mentioned before, they are pretty common. And school function is the one that is consistently low, even the, way the studies that actually report a bit higher quality of life scores, school function, it is always the lower one. Now, that's the summary of the data that is out there, but there is some limitations with the current data. Uh, one is, as I mentioned before, there is small sample size. So these are single center studies with a relatively small sample size. So for example, in terms of the power that they have to look at, uh, factors associated with quality of life is pretty limited based on the, uh, on the amount of patients that they have. Uh, the majority of the studies have significant loss to follow up. That goes from 25% to 85% on some of them. So you have to keep that in mind because maybe uh, that's a source for uh, potentially for a lot of bias and selection bias in terms of which uh, patients are we actually assessing this outcome. Uh, different ages at a time of assessment, you have to keep that in mind when you compare the studies. Some of them look at patients and their quality of life, like ours at four years of age, others at seven, and the one from DLAO actually at 20 years of age. So there are different uh, times of their lives, and uh, you have to keep that in mind. As I think there's a lack of research in terms of risk factors or factors associated with quality of life, and um, not just only in the acute care setting, but also through the progress later on. Uh, as I mentioned, different times of follow up. And also, I think there is a lack of research and on interventions that can actually foster and improve quality of life on this patient. And I think that's a, a huge area we can work on. So eventually, um, I think what we need to do is get these patients that were extremely ill to obviously survive uh, their ICU and get them out of the hospital. This is another patient of us. Uh, her name is Laura. The press obviously authorized me to show her pictures and her story. And, uh, but she had two episodes of cardiac arrest. One was an hour long, and we were able to get her out of the hospital. Um, but I think they, they get into a journey afterwards, which is not an easy one, and they need some guidance through it. And uh, sometimes they will need some support and, and extra tools to go through that journey. And they don't go through that journey alone. They actually do it together with their family. So I think it's our obligation to support our patients beyond the ICU and actually not to support only them, but also to support their families. 
So what we should do uh, going to the future, I think we need to keep trying to improve the acute care as much as we can. Um, and we can do that, as has been said in the previous talks, through protocols and having uh, clear um, instructions on how to push our patients to ECMO, how to manage their anticoagulation to try to, to diminish uh, serious complications, lots of simulations so our team can improve. I think there is a need for more research using larger samples, and that might imply actually collaboration uh, between centers uh, to be able to look at other factors and uh, things that we can change to improve the long-term outcomes. Um, we also need to identify modifiable risk factors. Um, I think follow-up clinics uh, has been established as a standard of care for cardiac patients. These are very high-risk patients, uh, even if they are not cardiac. And, uh, and I think they need to be follow up. And there is a recent study uh, published this year by Ray from, uh, from the UK, where they actually, they also asked the parents what they actually need and how they feel after surviving ECMO. And what they say is they need follow up. They need support beyond leaving the ICU. I think early intervention programs are, uh, should be uh, mandatory as well. And they are extremely useful and has been proven to actually change outcomes. And just think about it. It's like, if not, we're trying to sometimes kids, some of these kids will um, develop attention deficit issues, behavioral issues. And if you don't support them early on and through their process, you actually try and then to catch them later on when they get into school. And that might be all at, at one point, it might be too late. And as Kieran mentioned, not always they are caught at that time because some of them will not be easy identifiable. And normally schools and people trying to help them at school, they have not an understand and a good understanding of what processes patients have been through. And that's something that also the parents uh, from a race study have mentioned. Parent support groups have been mentioned by parents as very useful. And I think family involvement and, uh, and qualitative feedback, not just quantitative, as the quality of life scores is very important. So we know actually they are, the, these parents and these kids are looking for in terms of support. And I think I try as much as I could to keep it under 10 minutes and thank you very much. And I'm open to questions if you guys have. Good. Thank you very much. You do you want to close up the meeting? I think we are not going to have time for questions, guys, but I really want to thank you, all of you. Yeah. Gil Warnowski here. I, I also want to, uh, before Sasha talks, I just want to add my thanks to everyone, especially the panelists who've come from probably six to eight time zones mm -hmm. uh, to share their knowledge. It's been a very long webinar. Almost 400 people are still on, which is a real tribute to the interest in the topic. Um, we really want feedback. It's very, very important for us as we plan to do this on a weekly basis. As Grace shared with you before, we have Tetralogy coming up. We will be working on all aspects of pediatric cardiovascular disease, including EP, surgery, intensive care, neurodevelopment, et cetera, as well as the weekly imaging sessions that are coming up. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, the feedback, uh, Grace, the... Um, the survey monkey is in the uh, chat box. Is that right? We would really appreciate that. Yes, uh, all the links are on the chat box and everybody's going to receive by email as well. Oh, that's fantastic. And then I'll turn this over to my colleague and good friend, Sasha Gatti and Taramina. Yes, only to say that uh, this time, the, as uh, Grace said, the question and answer box was amazing with a very big chat. And I think that uh, this is another answer from survey is a natural survey so we are very i'm very happy and of course uh, it's a long way of science but uh, it works i'm very happy thanks to everybody i'll say one last thing sasha a couple questions come in i just want to remind everybody that these are simulcast on our youtube channel and can be viewed later on uh, we hope to be dividing them into individual talks so that you'll be able to find the individual things that you want to go back in on. Uh, thanks so much to everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all the- And everyone stay thanks safe. Thanks for inviting us. Stay safe, wear a mask.